In this video, I'm going to be going through how to create a full stack web application from start to finish using some of the most modern tools in the JavaScript ecosystem. I'll be going through how to use AWS Amplify, Next.js, Material UI, and TypeScript to create a fully serverless web application that is massively scalable with no extra effort required. To demonstrate all of these tools and how they work together, we'll be creating a fully functional Reddit clone, including features like a fully fleshed out authentication system with form validation built in, a fully serverless scalable database hosted on AWS infrastructure using DynamoDB, a GraphQL API hosted on AWS AppSync, which we'll use to perform queries and mutations on the data inside our database, storing users' uploaded images on the cloud inside an Amazon S3 bucket, all of the core features of Reddit, like creating posts with images included in them, having other people be able to see our posts, as well as upvote and comment on them. We'll also demonstrate the latest features in Next.js, like server-side rendering, static site generation, incremental site regeneration, as well as how to use the Next.js image component. Throughout the project, we'll be using industry standard tools like Prettier, ESLint, and Git, among other things, and I'll show you how to use those effectively within your projects as well. Lastly, we'll be using TypeScript throughout the project, as well as Material UI components, to style the site and make the web application look beautiful, accessible, and responsive. If you find yourself enjoying the video at any point, please consider hitting the like button as it really does help out my channel. And if you wanna see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel as well. Remember, I've also added timestamps to each chapter that we're gonna go through in this video. So if you find yourself already familiar with something that you wanna skip past, just simply go to the next chapter. And lastly, if you wanna have a look at the source code in case you get stuck at any point, or if you're just curious, I'll have a link in the description to the GitHub repository where you can find all of the source code that we're gonna create in this video. Or if you're really stuck on a specific thing, just leave a comment and I'll try my best to respond to you. Without further ado, let's jump right into the video. To get started using Next.js, you'll firstly need npm installed, but I'm just gonna assume that you have that already. If you don't, just go and quickly install it and then come back. To create a new Next.js project, we can simply type npx create next app and then the name of the application. For this, I'll just do Reddit clone. This is going to install all of the packages and set up a little dummy project with Next.js. If you want to check it out, you can change directories into the newly created project and then run npm run dev. This is going to start the server on localhost 3000. And if you just hold control and click that link, it'll open up the project that it's just set up. We'll kill the server by hitting control C and then run code dot to open up the project in Visual Studio code. Here we can see the boilerplate code that Next.js created for us via the commands that we just run. And this is the basic structure of any Next.js project. We've got the pages directory. We've got a little API route, which returns just the name of John Doe via an API request. So we can go ahead and delete that folder because we're not gonna be using that in this project. Then we've got the underscore app.js, which is a unique page to Next.js. This page pretty much wraps all of the other pages. So every single page is going to be wrapped around this underscore app.js component. So if you wanted to have global variables like they've imported here, the global CSS, that's gonna be affected on all of your pages. We'll use that later to create a header that's appearing on all of our pages. The next page that we have is the index.js page. And this is just the home page. So it's the slash route that we just saw, the um, page that we demonstrated just there. And we can just go ahead and delete all of this contents because it's not really what we want. So we'll just return a simple hello world. And then if we go back and run our code again, you can see on the home page we just have a simple hello world. So this is the index.js page. It's just the slash nothing route. Cool. So the first thing that we want to do is install TypeScript. We can do that by first of all killing our dev server that we were just running and creating a new file called tsconfig.js. Sorry, .json. And then if we go back to our code and run npm run dev for the third time, it's gonna send us a nice looking message saying, looks like you're trying to use TypeScript, but you don't have the required packages installed. And then actually gives us the command that we need to run. So we'll copy that command, paste it, and we'll also add a third package called at type slash node. This is gonna install the TypeScript package, the at types react package, and the at types node package. And then if we run npm run dev again, we'll notice that this tsconfig.json file actually gets auto-populated by Next.js. That's really all we need to do to configure TypeScript with Next.js. And if we go ahead and kill the server again and change these files to .tsx files, we have successfully set up TypeScript. So we run npm run dev and everything should work just fine. We go revisit the homepage. 
all looking good with no errors in the console. To clean up the project a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and delete the styles folder, and then we'll need to delete all the references to those styles from our pages. So we'll cut this styles reference in our index.tsx file, as well as the global styles in our app.tsx file. Then what I like to do is create a folder called SRC, stands for source, and move the pages directory inside the source folder. If we save the project, and we'll notice a bunch of errors occurred because we were messing around with references that didn't exist. And <laughs> we'll kill the server and run it again. And it compiles successfully now. You'll notice that the typography there, I'll zoom in a little bit, has changed since we're no longer using the styles generated by Next.js. The next thing I wanna do is set up all the tools that we're gonna be using throughout the project. So I wanna set up Git, I wanna set up ESLint and Prettier. If you wanna learn more about ESLint and Prettier, I actually have a blog post about what these tools do and how to set them up with TypeScript and Next.js a bit more in detail. So if you're really interested in these tools, then I would recommend checking out this, or I also have a video on my YouTube channel called how to set up Next.js with TypeScript, Prettier and ESLint. So if you wanna learn more, a bit more about that in detail, then I would definitely recommend checking out this blog post or that video. I'll have a link to that in the description or maybe a little pop up to the video on the video now. The first thing I want to set up is ESLint. ESLint's a tool that statically analyzes your code and finds problems that it can recognize. A lot of the problems that it finds can be auto fixed. So we're going to set up this package to analyze our code, recognize any problems. And then we're also going to set it up to automatically fix them when we hit the save button. To do that, I'll kill the dev server and we'll install a package called ESLint, npm install ESLint dash dash save dash dev. And if you're wondering what the save dev flag does, it means that we don't need this package in order for our application to run in production. Since this is just a tool that analyzes our code, we don't want to waste space by packaging it up with our code base. So this is only going to install it for our dev environment. To configure it, we'll run npx ESLint dash dash init, and I'll be using it to check syntax, find problems and enforce code style. I want to use JavaScript modules, import and export. We're using React for the framework and we'll say yes to our project using TypeScript. We'll select browser for where the code runs and I'll select a popular style guide. I typically go with a Google one, but it's up to personal preference. I like my config files to be in JSON format and I go ahead and install all of the required dependencies to use this. And as you can see, it's created an eslintrc.json file at the root of our project, which is where we can configure all of the rules that we want for this plugin. The next package that I want to install is a code formatter. The package is called Prettier. It pretty much just removes all of the original styling on a per user basis and outputs all of the code that conforms to a consistent code style. It's more useful if you have multiple developers on the project, but I just like to use it to automatically save and format the code the way that I like it. To install that package, we'll run npm install, sorry, npm install with the save dev flag again, and then we'll use the package name of Prettier. To avoid conflicts between ESLint and Prettier, we'll also install a package with the save dev flag called ESLint config dash Prettier. Then we'll go back to our ESLint rc.json file. And in this extends array, you can see that we've got the React recommended rules, as well as all of the rules that Google recommends. In here, we'll add Prettier. To configure Prettier, we can create a Prettier rc file at the root of our project. Here's where we can set all of the rules. If you want to see a complete list of the available rules, you can just Google it and see Prettier list of rules. We can go down to configuring Prettier and click options. Here's all the rules that you can configure. So you can see things like tab width, using tabs instead of spaces, adding semicolons to all of the end of your lines, using double quotes instead of single quotes, and things like that. I go with a pretty basic Prettier config. I set the end of line, but recently I've been using auto, so it doesn't really affect it that much. Then I set the print width, which sets the maximum length of the line to about 100. Set the tab width to two. And I'll set the trailing comma to ES5. If you hover over the key of each of these values, you can see what they actually do. So end of line, um, you can see that, well, maybe that's not such a good example, but for example, print width, you can see the line length where pretty will try and wrap. So if I have a huge line, uh, let's see if I can get an example here. I'll just add hello world a hundred times. And we click save. It might not work for you as you click save just yet. We'll set that up in one second, but you can see it's wrapping onto the next line rather than just having these huge lines. I think I might actually go with about 80 instead of hundred for that because that was a bit long. Cool. 
Now we don't want all of our files to be automatically configured by these two plugins. And to ignore specific files, we can create pretty ignore files and ESLint ignore files. Next.js automatically generates a .git ignore for all of the recommended things to ignore from Git. So we'll just copy paste the contents of that git ignore file into these two files as well. If you're using Visual Studio Code, you want to install these extensions as well. So you'll install the prettier extension, prettier-code formatter. I've already got it installed and the ESLint extension. Then we'll go to our preferences by hitting file, preferences and settings. And we'll search default formatter in the search bar. You want to make sure this is set to prettier code formatter. Next, we'll search format on in the search bar. And you want to make sure format on save is selected as well as format on paste. This is going to trigger prettier to run every time you hit the save button. So since I've got semicolon enabled, I believe, I'll just double check that. I actually don't have it enabled, so it might not work, but we'll see. It does add it automatically to the end of the line here. As you can see, this is an ESLint rule that's underlining this. It wants me to add a JS doc. I'm actually gonna disable that rule because I think it's pretty annoying. I'll show you how to disable specific rules that are part of the ESLint and Prettier packages in one second. If your code's not auto formatting, you wanna hit Alt Shift F and that will auto format your code. To set up specific formatting rules for this project, we can go ahead and create a .vs code folder at the root of our project. And within that, we'll create a settings.json folder a file, sorry. This is where we can set all of the configuration settings for this project specifically for our VS code. I'm gonna set the editor.format on paste to true for this project. And of course you can configure this however you like. I'm also gonna set editor.format on save to true. I'm going to set editor.default formatter to yes, and pretty obvious code. Then here's the mainly important part. We want editor.code actions on save which is an object. And firstly, we want to fix all from ESLint. Set that to true. And the next step we want to do is source.fixall.format to true. What this is going to do is every time we hit save, it's going to fix all of the auto fixable problems from ESLint. And then it's going to trigger Prettier to reformat all of the code the way that we want it every time we hit save. So if we want to disable specific rules within ESLint, we can go to the eslintrc.json file and we'll see we've got this default rules object here. I'll close all of the other files and, and open up the index.js file, index.tsx file, sorry, to see this error. It's saying missing JSX document or JS document. And that is the eslint rule of required JS doc. And if you control click that link, you can actually go and see what this is complaining about. So since we don't have this comment with a valid return type, all of the parameters and their types. It's complaining since that's a rule configured by the ESLint um, Google extension. We can go ahead and disable that by running required.js doc. Of course it needs to be in quotes because it's a JSON file and we'll just say off. Now we can see that there is no error complaining about JS doc, we've got a new error called react slash react in JSX scope. Now this is actually uh, not required anymore with react 17. You don't have to have react in scope to use react anymore. Um, you can use these elements without importing react directly. So we'll go ahead and control click that rule and we'll copy the name of the rule. And we'll also disable that one. Cool. This is complaining that we haven't used these imports and we're gonna go ahead and delete all unused imports and click save. And you'll notice when we click save that it pushed the file up, deleted all of the blank space. And if we try and mess about the format a little bit, see this is terrible code, we click save, all, all just gets formatted. I don't know why that return statement did that. Maybe it was confused, but um, you can see it gets auto formatted and fixes all of the available problems that it's aware of as you click save every time. This is complaining that it doesn't have any types, but we'll fix that in a short second. We can fix that by going to next.js TypeScript. And this is the underscore app.js file. So next.js actually has specific types for these components and the page props, I believe. So if we just search for page props, maybe 
yeah, we've got the custom app TypeScript types here and we'll just copy this whole thing actually. It's probably easier. Delete all of these unnecessary comments as well as that unused import there. Cool. The next thing that I want to do is install material, can't even say that, material UI to the project. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but if you actually go to Next.js GitHub on Google and you click the top link, take you to GitHub, they have an examples folder with all of the possible examples that you'll need to start a project with. Um, for example, with AWS Amplify TypeScript is the example repository that I committed. So this would set up the project with AWS Amplify and TypeScript if you wanted to just shortcut that setup. But I think it's better to understand how it works behind the scenes. And it also comes with a bunch of boilerplate code to demonstrate the different features, which we don't really want. So what I want to do here is go material UI and we'll go to that folder here and you'll see that it's been moved to the material UI repository. So we'll just click that link and we'll open up the pages and the source folders as we're going to be copying a couple of different folders here of different files, sorry. So the first one we want to do is open up app.js, document.js, and then in the source folder, we also want to copy the theme.js file. Now we already have one of these app.js's, so we will copy the contents of this file and we'll go to our app.js and we'll just paste it below. And you can see we'll need all of these imports. So we'll copy those imports and use them in our app.js file. You can see we're missing some packages here, specifically the material UI packages, but we'll install those shortly. And we're also missing that theme file, which we opened up in GitHub. But as you can see here, we've got a bunch of different code, which we will need to use for our underscore app.js file. We've already destructured these prop variables in our um, parameters here, so we can get rid of that line. But this react use effect function we'll need to use. So we'll copy paste that into our function. We actually don't need that react dot. We can just import use effect from, whoops, that's not what I wanted. That's also not what I wanted. Um, sorry, I think that was an extension doing that. Use effect, that's a comma, not a dot. Use effect from React. And as you can see, this is removing the server side injected CSS. I, to be honest, I don't really understand completely how this works. I do know how this part works. I'll explain that very shortly. Uh, we also don't need that because we're using TypeScript, so we don't need prop types as we can just type them as we've already done. And we'll cut out this and return that instead. Cool, and then we'll get rid of this duplicate stuff. What we'll default my app? All right, it's happy. We'll get rid of prop types because we don't need it. Pretty much, we're returning a React fragment, which is just pretty much an empty div to wrap all of this stuff around. And then we're using the Next.js head component to um, set the SEO title. So we'll set that to React Clone. That's going to be the um, the name of the tab. So this will be instead of Vercel GitHub up here, it will be Red. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said React, I meant Reddit clone. And then as you can see, we're using this theme provider, passing down the theme as the theme value. And this is actually using the React context API behind the scenes. And pretty much we're using that because we want to send down this theme to all of our components. And whenever we want to use a theme value from the theme.js file that we're about to create, we'll be able to extract the CSS variables and the styling and the consistent typography styles, uh, the color theme and things like that out of this theme variable. We'll be able to use it in all of the components and the pages throughout our project. And we've got the CSS baseline component here. To be honest, I don't really know what that does. Probably some material UI thing. And then we're just returning all of the pages wrapped around the underscore app.js as we were before. We'll go ahead and go back to the files that we opened up. We've also got this underscore document.jsx file, js file, sorry. So we'll copy the contents of that. Create a new file called underscore. Is it underscore document.tsx? Yeah, it is. Cool. And we'll paste that in as well. Get rid of all of these comments. Get rid of that as well. And as you can see, it's complaining about missing the material UI package as well. Um, as well as the theme file that we're about to create. Pretty much this is just specific stuff for us to use uh, Material UI as well as server-side rendering. 
I honestly don't really understand the details of how it works. I've always just copied it like this. The last thing we want to copy is this theme.js file. So we'll go to the source folder and we'll create a new file called theme.ts. We'll pass that in here. So as you can see, we're creating an MUI theme where we can define things like the palette. We're also going to be defining things like the typography. You can also set overrides for the defaults of the material UI components in this file. And to use all of this, we'll need to install the npm install material at material UI, I believe it is. Nope, I was wrong. npm install at material UI slash core. I also like to install a package called uh, Material UI Icons. You can install that by copying that. So that's npm install at Material UI Icons. Cool. So let's test that out by going back to our homepage. We'll import topography from at Material UI Core. Instead of returning a div, we'll return Typography, and we'll pass in the variant option and we'll set it to h1 jsx element typography does not have any construct or call signatures uh that's because we need to wrap this in that well cool. now if we go back to our command line run npm run dev should be able to see a big material y h1 tag on our home page We'll need to fix the relative import on the underscore app.tsx file. So dot dot slash source. I believe it should just be dot dot slash theme. So that is just a error with the import there. It's probably the same here. So we'll delete the source folder from the relative import. Go back to our page and reload it. It's not happy with the underscore document.js file. Let's try just clear it, run the server again. Okay, it's truly not happy. Okay, so <laughs> the reason we're pretty stupid, we're missing the return statement from the homepage. Simple fix. Nice, okay, took me a couple minutes, but <laughs> um, we were missing the actual return from the homepage, so we weren't returning anything. And then that obviously breaks the rules of React, but now we've got this nice hello world in the material y um, h1 tag on our index homepage there. I don't think that I want to install is the AWS Amplify CLI. If you go to the get started page on the Amplify docs, you'll see that you need to install the package AWS Amplify slash CLI and pass the G flag to install it globally. Cool. And then you'll notice the prerequisites for installing AWS Amplify. You should already have Node.js and NPM and you'll need to verify that you're at least running Node.js version 10, npm-v, oh, that was the wrong one, npm-v, and node-v, we're running 16, so we need to be greater than 10.x and greater than 6.x, and we've got 16.1 and 7.12, so we're absolutely fine with that. The third thing you'll need to do is create an AWS account. Now, I've already done that. I'm not gonna show you how to create an AWS account. It's pretty simple, but go ahead and do that if you don't have one already. And then you'll need to configure the AWS Amplify CLI. To do that, we'll run the Amplify configure command on the CLI. It's gonna take you to a URL, press enter to continue, and you'll be able to pick your region from the top right here. So for me, it's Asia Pacific 2. AP Southeast 2. So I'll scroll down all the way to AP Southeast 2 and we'll just select the default username for the IAM user. And this is going to take you to a link for you to create an IAM user from the IAM management console. So it doesn't really matter what you name this, all of the parameters that it wants you to accept are passed in as parameters to the URL. So you can just click next, click next, next, and create user. Then you'll want to copy the access key ID. Go back to the CLI, press enter, paste the access key ID, and the secret access. I will copy paste off screen so you guys don't steal my shit. Paste that in there as well. Cool, okay. And the profile name is Cool 
person, whatever you want to set it up as. And cool, now we've configured the Amplify CLI. Now, if we go back to the Get Started documentation, we can skip down to here and we'll notice the next step is to run Amplify init. So make sure you're in the correct repository. You want to run this from the correct directory. Sorry, you want to run this from the Reddit clone folder that we created with our create next app command at the very beginning of the video. So we'll go ahead and clear the console and move it back to the center and we'll run Amplify init. Uh, we'll enter a name for the project. We'll just give it the name of Reddit clone. Uh, that's my previous configuration. So we'll just ignore that for now. We'll enter a name for the environment, which is dev. That's fine. We're using Visual Studio Code for the default editor. And we're building it out in TypeScript technically, but JavaScript is what we select here. We're using React for the framework. Source directory is the source directory path. The build distribution directory path is build. Build command is npm run build and npm run start for, for the start command. We'll use the AWS profile that we just created for the authentication method. And we'll select cool person, which is the profile that we just created. This is just going to initialize a project in the AWS Amplify console and create the project in the AWS cloud. It might take a little while, so we'll come back and check on this in a second. All right, so now we've initialized our AWS Amplify application in this directory. And if we go back to our Visual Studio code, you will notice that we now have this AWS exports file. And once we start adding some AWS Amplify features, we'll have a bunch more in this file. And we've also got this Amplify directory here, which is what I was looking for. And we'll also have a bunch of configuration stuff in here. Now it's not too clear what the hells are going on in these files just yet, but once we start adding some authentications, some APIs and some storage, a lot of the configuration will just be printed out into configuration files like these JSON files, for example, and you'll be able to modify those configuration files via this Amplify CLI. Before we get started adding AWS Amplify resources to our project, I wanna first configure our Material UI palette. And to do that, we can go to the Material UI documentation, Material UI color palette. And if we scroll down to about the middle of the page here, you'll notice a tools by the community section. And if you click on the second one here, Material UI Theme Editor, it'll bring you to a nice little website where you can actually download uh, and preview the Material UI themes and preview all of the components, so all of the buttons and what the text looks like, and then just download it as a JSON file. Do I trust the author of these files? Yes. And if we auto format that file with our Control S key, we can see something that looks very similar to the theme.ts file that we created. So this palette here is what we've already generated with the um, file that we copy pasted from the recommended GitHub Material UI Next.js repository. But this theme.js file, theme.json file, sorry, that we've downloaded goes into a bit more depth. So we've got the background of the paper and the default background, the common colors for the text if it's dark mode and light mode, and we've got contrast text and all of these things, but I've actually already created a theme that I like to use. It's in one of my other projects. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that theme from that file. And this file will be available in the description below. If you want to use the same theme, I recommend you play around with this website a little bit as well. If you want to create your own custom theme, I've just created a theme that I really like in another one of my projects. It's a nice dark theme with uh, a bunch of different configurations that we're going to go through here. So let's take a quick look at what we're actually configuring before we move on from what we've just pasted. So we've got the palette here. We'll go through that first. And pretty much what this defines is the default values for all of the styles throughout your project. And as we discussed earlier in this underscore app.js file, we're using this theme provider to provide the theme to all of the components and all of the pages that are going to be created for our application. So that's the method of how it's going to be passed down. I've just gone ahead and install this color highlight extension off screen so you guys can get a better visualization of what these colors are. As you can see for the background, we've got two different nice dark colors for the background and then of course for the contrast text of those dark colors, you want to have the nice white text, but we've also got these variations of different shades of gray um, for the different levels of importance. So for the primary, we've got just pure white and slowly sort of descends into 
more and more gray as the level of importance decreases. And then for this primary palette, we've got a nice bright blue. For the secondary, we've got a less sort of turquoise teal color. And for the arrow, we've got a big bright red. And down here, we're actually configuring the typography. This is just an override for saying that I don't want the capitalize, uh, sorry, I don't want the buttons to be all capitalized. So by default, um, Material UI capitalizes all the letters in the buttons, which I don't really like. So I've disabled that to be none. And then this is a custom font family. Uh, I'm using the inter font. I think it's really nice. I actually stole this, um, this array of fonts from another website that I really liked. Um, so I don't think that I came up with this all by myself. I just saw it on another website and saw it, it was really nice. I think if you go to the Next.js site, it might actually even be from that website, but I'll show you guys how to go ahead and copy any style that you like as well. So if we go to uh, the Next.js website and I hit the F12 key to bring up the console, I click this button to inspect an element. And let's say I want this um, H1 tag. I want to copy the style. I think it looks really nice. I'll go ahead and click that and then bring up the styles tab in the console here and scroll down to the font family. And as you can see, it is the actual Next.js website that I've taken this font family array from, and it begins with the inter font and slowly goes down to all of these other fonts here. Now, I think if you're more interested in learning more about how Next.js works with typography, I think Lee Robertson has a really good blog post about it, as well as a good video. I'll bring that up for you guys if you are interested. So web fonts in 2021 is a great blog post by Lee Robinson, who is, uh, I think he's the lead developer relations person at uh, Next.js now. He is head of developer relations. Yep, this is a great blog post by him. He's much more knowledgeable about web fonts and Next.js in general than I am. But if you're more interested in how to make good looking designs, especially on Next.js, definitely recommend you check out Lee Robinson. Not only just this blog, um, he has some excellent content about Next.js as well. But if you're not really interested in that, we'll just move on to all of the other configurations for typography that we have. So this is all just the defaults for the H1 tags and things like that. So as you saw before, if we go to index.tsx, we're passing this variant H1 into the typography. And that is now going to adopt these default settings. Obviously, Material UI has their own uh, default settings that you don't need to configure. So this is just overriding them all. And I want the font size to be or REM and the font weight to 700, line height one, and the color to be purely white. Uh, all of these are just configurations for those different typographies. And down here, we've got the uh, overrides for the MUI input base. I probably don't actually need that. So I will go ahead and delete that as well. And then by exporting it, we've got the responsive font sizes uh, wrapped around the theme. And if we go visit this page here, that will explain a little bit better why we're doing that. But pretty much it is generating responsive typography settings based on the options received. So rather than having a huge giant um, H1 tag, for example, this might be an H3 or H2 tag. Uh, it wants to be different sizes depending on the width and height of the viewport. Obviously, you don't want a huge H1 tag taking up three quarters of the screen on a mobile device, so you'd wanna scale it down. And that's what that function allows you to do if you pass your theme into it and then export it inside that. Cool, so now if we run our server again, go check out our homepage, we'll be able to see that we have a very similar um, H1 tag that look, probably looks a lot like this. Um, I think this will have different font weights. This one has 800, for example. Mine had 700, if I remember correctly. Cool, okay. So as you can see, now we've got the dark mode as the default background, and we've got this H1 tag in the inter font here, with of course the FFF that we configured in this H1 default all the way down here. So as you can see, font size for REM, it might not actually be that since the viewport might be scaled down a little bit, but if we increase it, as you can see, zoomed to 100%, it's kind of changing in size as the screen gets smaller and bigger as it gets bigger which is exactly what we want. If you're on a mobile device, you obviously want it to be a different size than when you're on the desktop. Cool. So I'd recommend you play around and look at the documentation for the Material UI theme, uh, creating your own palette, creating your own typography with the fonts that you like. But of course, if you want to use the same one that I'm using, definitely recommend checking out the link in the description to get the source code for that one and just copy pasting it in. Cool. So the final piece of configuration I want to demonstrate is using the uh, Git. So we'll go ahead and go to 
GitHub and we'll create a GitHub repository. So I was just reading my notifications. So we'll go to github.com. If you don't already have an account or if you already know what you're doing with Git, feel free to skip this chapter, of course. Uh, we'll go ahead and create a new repository. We'll call it Reddit clone. We'll make it public so that you guys can see it. Create a repository and it gives us the instructions so that we can set up the project. Uh, so we'll go back to the command line. We'll type git init. We'll say git remote add origin and paste that link. And if you go to Visual Studio Code, you can see all the changes that you can add. So I'll go ahead and select everything. You could do it this way, or you could go to the command line and say git add dot, and that will add everything into this repository. So now we've all, all of those changes that we've made have been staged. And we'll say git commit dash M to pass in the message. Actually, I believe we missed a step to set the branch. Yep, git branch dash M main. And then we'll say git commit minus M in this, uh, what do we want to call it? We'll say configuring all the tools. And then we can say git push. And we'll need to set the upstream. So we'll copy that link and paste that. What that's going to do is push all of our code into this repository so that we can keep track of the changes over time. And not only that, if we ever lose our project on our local computer, for some reason, we won't completely lose it as it's stored on the cloud. So as you can see, if you're not familiar with Git, we've just pushed um, our entire folder up to GitHub and other people can access our code and download it. And we can also access and download it on other computers. And it's just much safer to view the changes over time because you'll be able to revert back to changes if you make a problem or an issue that you don't want and you want to revert it. There's a bunch of powerful features of Git, but it's not the topic to go into just yet because it's quite complex. All right, now it's time to start adding some functionality via the Amplify CLI. First thing I'm going to do is add an API using Amplify Add API. I'll move this back into the center. This is going to enable us to create a GraphQL API. So I'll select GraphQL. I'll name it Reddit Clone API. And the default authorization type for the API we're going to select API key under a description for the API key, pool API key. You can select however many days you want. I'm just going to do the maximum. Whoops. Well, one off the maximum, apparently. Do you want to configure advanced settings for the GraphQL API? Let's say yes, just so we can demonstrate what the optional configurations are. Configure additional auth types. Now I'm actually going to select yes here. And the additional authorization type that I want to configure is Amazon Cognito user pools, because this is going to allow us to interact with authorization rules on our GraphQL API. So for example, only the creator of a post should be able to edit and delete their own post. And using the Amazon Cognito pools interacting with that, we can determine rules based on the owner of a post. So we can limit the public to only be able to read the post and we can limit the owner of the post based on their username to be able to access the delete functionality, the edit functionality, the write functionality, and things like that. So we'll select Amazon Cognito pools, bleh, Amazon Cognito user pools for the authorization type here. We will go default configuration for now, and we want users to be able to sign up with their username since we're creating a Reddit clone. If you want to configure advanced settings, we'll say yes. The only required sign up attribute I really want is the email. Don't want to add any of these. Enable conflict detection, I'm just going to say no. You have an annotated GraphQL schema, we don't, so we'll say no again. And here is where we get to generate a template GraphQL schema. So ours is going to be most similar to blogs with posts and comments. So I'm going to select the one-to-many relationship of blogs with posts and comments. And do you want to edit the schema now? We'll say yes. And that is going to bring up the GraphQL schema specific to the AWS Amplify configuration that has just been generated by that Amplify CLI that we've just initialized. You'll also notice a bunch of different changes that we've made from the Amplify CLI. So all of these differences from our previous commit are from what we've just done on the Amplify CLI. So we've added authorization and we've also added the GraphQL API. So this is where we really wanna start thinking about the design of our database the entities within our database and how those entities relate to one another, one another. So when you think about Reddit, pretty much there's only two real things that you can do. You can create a post or you can comment on a post. 
Obviously you can do other things to the post like delete and edit it, but those are the core concepts of Reddit. There's no real concept of blog, but luckily for us, this default schema is actually quite similar to what we really want in our end product. So I'll go ahead and delete the concept of blog from this generated schema. And now we end up with a post model and a comment model. I'll separate these unique AWS Amplify things into their own lines. So we can dive into those in a little bit. Apparently not, Prettier It's not gonna let me do that, so never mind. But pretty much what we have is each type with the at model annotation attached to it is going to be created as a table within our AWS DynamoDB database. So we'll have a table for posts and we'll have a table for comments. Between those two tables, we'll have connections via these at key annotations. So you'll be able to get comments by post with this at key. To do that, we've made an at connection annotation on this comments field in this post model. So you can see comment is of type, sorry, comments is of type, an array of comment types. So one post can have many comments, which is exactly what we want. And then we'll be able to query each comment associated to its post. So when we want to display all of the comments from a specific post, we'll be able to grab them from our GraphQL API. Not sure how you make comments in here. Um, we'll be able to grab them from our GraphQL API with the post ID, title, and then comments. We'll be able to grab all of the IDs of each comment, the post ID of each comment, and the contents of each comment by its parent post. That's what that connection there does. So if we go into the AWS Amplified documentation, you can see we can define model types with the at model annotation. And it says object types that are annotated with at model are top level entities in the generated API. Objects with annotated at model are stored in Amazon Dynamo, <laughs> Amazon Dynamo DB and are capable of being protected via the at auth tag, which we're about to jump into. You can add related other objects with them via the at connection annotation. You can also add the at searchable annotation. Then if we go to adding relationships between types, it's talking about the at connection annotation, which enables you to specify relationships between at model types. Currently it supports one-to-one, -one, one to many and many to one relationships. So the relationship that we've defined is has many. As you can see, this looks, this is pretty much exactly what we've got in our schema at the moment. So one post can have many comments. It says, note how a one to many connection needs an at key that allows comments to be queried by the post ID. And the connection uses this key to get all comments whose post ID is the ID of the post that was called on. After it's transformed, you can create comments and query the connected post as follows. So you'll create a post and then you can create a comment on that post with the ID of the post. Sorry, with the ID of the post here. So you input the ID of the comment itself, the contents of that comment, and you'll also need to associate it with the created post. And then once you want to read that data, you'll be able to get the post, all of the post contents, and then all of the post comments and all of the contents of those comments as well, which is exactly what we wanna do. So that's the very basics of AWS Amplify's schema um, GraphQL type system. And of course, these are all just fields that we'd be able to use. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, we'll be returning a post. And then if you want the title of the post, you'll go post.title or comment.content to display the actual contents of that comment. So hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory. But now we're gonna be diving into adding authorization rules directly into the schema. To do that, we'll have a look at the documentation and we'll go set up authorization rules. What we're interested in is this owner authorization. And we want the owner of a post and as well as a comment to be able to edit and delete their own comments and everyone else on the system, all other signed in users or non-signed in users to be able to read those posts and those comments. To do that, we'll create a rules array that looks something like this. So on our post, we'll say at auth rules and an array of rules. And the first thing we wanna do is say owner, and then we'll go back to the owner authorization just so we can refresh our memory a little bit. Allow owner, owner field owner, which we don't actually have to define. I believe that's inherited. We'll copy and paste this so we can give the owner all access that we want. So we want allow owner, owner field is owner, which we don't need to define because that's the default value. So we'll just cut that. 
the operations that we want the owner to be able to perform is the create, update, delete, and read. So that's all of the operations that are possible on the post. And this needs to be in an object, sorry. Cool. And then as a second rule, we'll have the private, which is all signed in users, operations, read. And then we'll also add a third rule, allow public operations read. So we'll go ahead and add some comments to explain what each of these mean. So owner can perform any action on their own post. Other signed in users can read everyone's posts. And then non signed in users, guests can read everyone's posts as well. And we'll copy this authorization logic into our comments model as we want the same logic for that one as well. We'll remove the comments here. Cool. To commit that code, we'll run amplify push. Yes, we're sure we want to continue. And yes, we definitely do want to generate code for the newly created GraphQL API. We want that code to be generated in TypeScript. We'll accept the default for the pattern. And we do want to generate all of the possible GraphQL queries, mutations, and subscriptions so that we can use them in our application. The maximum statement depth is referring to how nested is your structure. So ours is theoretically two levels deep. So a post can have many comments. Just to be safe, I'm going to set as three. File for the generated code, we'll just say source slash api.ts. Now that that's deployed, we can check it out in the UI by running amplify console and then selecting Amplify Console. All right, so this is where you can see all the resources that you've created for your AWS Amplify project. If you don't see something like this, you wanna make sure that you're in the right region in the top right here. I've had that pro problem before where I've been in uh, US East one or something and I couldn't see my project. It was a bit confusing, but just make sure you're in the same region that you specified from the CLI. So we're not gonna be using the admin UI for this video, but I'll just go ahead and close that. And here you can see we've added the two categories that we added by the CLI. So we've got authentication and API. And if you go ahead and click on both of these tabs, you can actually go ahead and see all of the resources that got created via the commands that we run from Amplify Add API. We would have had to run Amplify Add Auth, but we actually did that when we specified that we wanted Amazon Cognito user pools to interact with the API. So we've added both of those resources in that one command there. And if you want to have a little play around, you can just go ahead and click both of these links. And then let's say you want to see the users of your application. You would go ahead and view that in the Amazon Cognito instance that's been created for your project. Obviously, we don't have any um, users for this project since we just created it, but you can go ahead and have a quick look around and see all the settings that have been configured. Honestly, there's not, not too much you can change here that's any use, but if you go to the API and view that in AppSync, this is where it gets a bit more interesting. So you'll be able to see on the left-hand side here, we've got the schema of our application and you can see this GraphQL kind of playground here that shows you the entire schema of your schema.graphql that we created. And then if you go to the data sources, it's kind of reflective of what we were talking about before when we have uh, a table for posts and a table for comments. So if you go into the post table, that's gonna open up DynamoDB. And here you'll be able to see all of the posts that get created in this items tab. And obviously we don't have any yet, but if we go ahead to the next thing I wanna show you, which is queries on this, this uh, app sync tab, this is where we'll be able to create some dummy data. But the thing is, if we wanna create anything, since our, our rules specify that only um, sign in users or the, it says owner, but pretty much it means only users can create the post. And since we don't have a user, we'll need to set up the logic to sign up a user and then sign in that user so they can, um, so that we can log in on this portal here and then log in as that user and create some posts and comments and then we'll be able to better visualize how these queries and mutations and I don't think we're gonna jump into subscriptions in this video, but um, we'll be able to visualize what our data is coming back as and how we can interact with these comments um, and posts via this GraphQL API. If you also jump back into the code here, you'll notice a bunch more files have been created. And if you go to the source slash GraphQL folder that should have been created, we now have these folders called these files. Sorry, I keep saying that 
mutations, queries, and subscriptions. <coughs> we also have this folder, this file, I don't know why I keep saying that. We also have this file called api.ts, and these are all of the TypeScript types of all of the possible mutations, inputs, um, data coming back from the GraphQL API. So for example, if I search for, um, uh, what do I want to search for? Type, type, uh, create comment mutation. You'll see that we have a mutation, um, a type for this mutation, which will input the create comment object. And we'll need to input the ID of the comment, the post ID that that comment is on the content of the comment. And these two fields are automatically generated, but this is the data that's going to come back out of the create comment mutation request. So for example, if we wanted to get data out of the GraphQL API, we would say type uh, query or type <laughs> mutation, sorry, type post. Yep. Jesus, that took me a while. Sorry, it's a new day early in the morning. My brain's still not working. So we have export type post. And as you can see, it's pretty much reflected all of the fields that we could possibly want from the post and export type comment, update post input, delete post input, all of the things that you could possibly do with the GraphQL API, all of the CRUD operations, there's all these TypeScript types. And what you'll do with them is you'll call these queries and mutations. So if you want to get a post from the GraphQL API, we can use this auto generated get post um, function here or this GraphQL query. And then if we want to create a post, yeah, uh, oh, that'll be in the mutations for file. <laughs> mutations file, that would be the create post GraphQL mutation here. As you can see, we need to pass in the input, um, which we will use to populate that mutation and create a post in the database. These subscriptions are for live updating data. Um, I don't think we're gonna use subscriptions. We'll see if we get to that, but pretty much it's the same thing as a query, except it's listening for new creations of a specific event. So you would create a subscription to listen to on create post events. Um, so whenever a create post is triggered on the GraphQL mutation, this will fire off and let you know what the data inside that new created post is. And you can use that to um, send live updates to maybe the state of your application and then display that on the UI. But I don't think we're gonna use that. So that's just a quick explanation of what these files are. It's really, really helpful. And you'll see how we're going to use these queries and these mutations in combination with this uh, API.ts and these TypeScript types here to create a really type safe, um, really powerful application. And these queries will also work on the server side inside things like Next.js's get server side props, if you're familiar with that. So we'll be able to use these requests on the server side and we'll also have server side authentication on them as well, which is really powerful. So we'll jump into that in a short second. For the authentication side of things, I'm going to be using a library called React Hook Form. It's pretty much just a simple way to create forms. Um, and when you submit a form, it gives you the variables that you typed into each uh, field. It also gives you back errors and you can also configure the rules that you want to specify on each field. So if you want the first name, for example, to be only a minimum of three letters long and a maximum of, I don't know, 32 letters long or something like that, and you want it to specific and you want it to be a specific pattern, then you'll need to uh, configure that within the React hook form. This is probably the my favorite way of creating forms with React. Um, it's very simple and it's also really simple to implement with Material UI and as well as TypeScript. So I think this is a great library to work with and I'm gonna go ahead and install that now. To do that, I'll run npm install React hook form. And we'll go down to the integrating with UI libraries tab. We'll try and find material UI here. Oops. I'll just search for it. Here we go. Material UI core slash input. Mm, what do we got here? I think this is a decent example of what we kind of want to do here. So I'm going to click the TypeScript tab and I will go back to our code. I'll go to pages, create a um, 
what do we want to call it? We want to call it signup.tsx. And I actually have an extension called, what's it called? ES7 React Redux GraphQL React Native Scripts, which allows me to create uh, just boilerplate functions really quickly. So if I type TSRFC, it's going to come up with all of these different options for just starter code for React components. So I'm just going to go TSRFC, click that one, and it pretty much gives us the name. I'll capitalize that quickly. Um, really nice little starter code from that extension. So I definitely recommend that. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this whole thing from this example here. Um, I'll actually just replace all things. So that was <laughs> a bit of a waste of an example, but I'll get rid of that react select library. It's not what I want for this sign up. I'll need to export the default sign up. Um, function sign up. Get rid of that arrow function. Cool. All right. We'll get rid of that select here. We'll also get rid of this controller, I believe. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of other examples. I don't really think I need this controller thing. Um, I do want this form and I want the on submit. Uh, we'll also get rid of that input type because when you use the material UI button, um, we will import the button from material UI here. We'll just say variant equals 10. And the button says sign up. And then if we hover over the button, we should be able to import from material UI core. We'll get rid of that import. We'll get rid of the controller import as well. Um, the on submit, we want to console log the data. I'll just say console.log submitted the form. Miley. And if we run the server, go back to the homepage. Should just do it in a new tab. But hello world on the homepage. And if we go to the slash sign up, we get a button that says sign up and it doesn't work. So that's not good. Um, not sure <laughs> what happened there. Um, form, oh, okay, we're missing the type equals submit, I believe. Refresh, done, cool. All right, so now it's time to start adding some of the fields that we want. And if you're not familiar with Material UI, we'll go to the Material UI docs. And we actually have these text field um, components. And they just pretty much look like this. You can type whatever you want. It's different variations. So we've got the standard field outlined, a um, bunch of different options that you can have. They also have form validation with the error and the helper text, which we're going to be using. Um, I believe if we go back to React Hook Form Docs, they actually have a better example than what we were using before. So I'm going to try and see what we were doing previously. Where is that? Set value. This is more like the code that I'm kind of wanting to use. I don't really want that control component. I'm actually going to change the import here from const control handle submit to something that looks a bit more like this. I want the register. I don't really think I want form stay. I think I just want errors. And then I also want handle submit. Um, so what I'll do is I will console.log errors, errors, and the handle submit we actually already have. So I'll cut this to be up here. Cut that out. Cool. Okay. Let's take a look in the console here. See what errors is. Errors is undefined. Cool. And that, I believe, the errors is going to change whenever we update the fields after they've submitted. So we'll get into that in a bit. 
But the next thing we want to do is add these text field components. So I just want these standard ones. So I'm going to copy this code for, I'll actually look into it and we'll see what we've got. We've got the text field ID, blah, blah, blah. So I'll copy that. Text field ID, add text field to the missing import there. Um, ID, let's say email. Oh, we actually want username, sorry. And label is username. Username. And then we will need to register it with the React hook form, as you can see they're doing in this code here. So register, first name required true. Copy that. Then for each one of these validation rules, we want the message to be different. So for example, if the user doesn't fill out their username, we want the message to be uh, username is required. But if the username entered is like one letter long, we'll say, you know, please enter a username that is between three and 16 characters or something like that. So to do that, we can actually pass in an object for this required value. And we can say, sorry, required, and then pass an object here. Uh, and the value set to true. And then the message, we can say, username, or oh, please enter a, enter a username. Then we can also add another rule. So you can see if you hit control space, we have all of these different rules. We've got pattern, min, max, um, a bunch of different validation rules that you can have. I think the main ones that we're interested in is min, max, and pattern, um, which is gonna be a regex pattern to only allow users to uh, enter, you know, numbers, underscores, letters. I don't think we'll go into too much detail because it's not really something that I want to dive into too much. It takes a little bit of time to get that right, but uh, we'll say min three. I think that's min length actually, min length uh, value three. Message, please enter a username over or between three sixteen characters. And then we'll copy that and we'll say max length uh, 16. And the same error message there. Okay, so let's go back to the UI now. And if we enter a username that's one letter long and click sign up, it's not seeming to work, but we'll go, <laughs> go back to that and hopefully it works in a little bit. But if we do that, that's between three and 16 characters. That's over and it's not working. Um, not sure where the error message is going. Maybe it's in here that we need to paste the errors. And sign up, A, sign up. Okay, I'm not sure where the error message is going here, but we'll figure out that out in a little bit. Errors does not exist. Okay, that's probably why. Uh, I think that's because we actually need form, form state, maybe, yeah. And then the errors within there. Let's see if that works now. Um, console log errors. Or oh, console log it outside of that function there. Errors. Okay, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Let's look at the errors here. And if you sign up, errors, username, message, please enter a username between three and 16 characters. And gives us the reference to that there. So what we can do just go back to this material UI text field value and we'll search for helper text um, validation. Sorry, so we've got error prop toggles the error state. And what we'll do is we'll say error. The first thing we want to do is set this Boolean value of error. Uh, we'll put it down here error equals. And then what we want to extract is that error status of the username value. So we'll go errors dot uh, username. Question mark. So if there is errors dot username, set it to true. If there's not, we'll set it to false. And then for the error message, we can use the helper text. Errors dot username. If there is an errors dot username, set it to errors dot username. Otherwise, we'll set it to null. 
Now, if we... Objects are not valid. Oh, that's because we need the message, not the actual value. Actually, sorry, I'll put that here. Message. Expected token. Get rid of that dot that we just typed. All right, please enter a username. Please enter a username between three and 16 characters. And if we type a valid username, it goes away. If it's too long, you know, gotta be fixed, which is exactly what we want. Cool. So now all we need to do is we'll just copy paste this for, which I believe we want to set the type uh, to be, what can we set it as here, text. And then we'll copy paste this. Grid item, grid item. And the second one we want is email. We'll set the label to be email. We'll register it as email. Please enter a valid email. Please enter, uh, I don't really care that much about this. As long as it's a valid email, we will fix up the password here as well. So we change username to password, label to password, register it as the password field. Please enter a password. Min length should be eight. Max length, I don't really care. Please enter a valid password. A Let's just say a stronger password. Please enter a password for the required and the min length. Please enter a stronger password. This should be changed to password, not username. And uh, this should be email instead of username as well. So we're displaying the right message for, sorry, message, message. Oh my God, I'm getting more messed up. Password.message. So that's displaying the error message for password on the password field and rather than what we were showing, which would be the username message, which wouldn't be relevant to that field. All right, so this should be type email. This should be type password so that it's hidden. All right, let's go back to our thing, error.password.message. Errors dot password dot message. I'm not sure why that's not happy. We'll see. I'm not sure why it's auto filling. Um, I don't really like this spacing, so I'm going to lower the spacing to one. Maybe even zero. Just cut the spacing out. Um. All right. Looks pretty good to me. So what we want to do. Sign up, please enter a username, please enter a valid email, please enter a password, we'll enter a valid username. As you can see, the errors over here are decreasing to only email and password. Email, uh, material, I think this is just the raw HTML, it's telling us it's not a valid email. Still not a valid email, we'll enter at gmail.com. Still not a valid email, but it's good enough, whatever. Uh, blah, 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 for the password. If it's only one letter long, can't enter it. That error message is not showing up for some reason. Let's see what we did wrong here. Errors.password instead of username. Yep, please enter a stronger password. And we'll set the styles of this button to be margin top 16 pixels so we can see that error message properly. All right, very nice. So now we can sign up a user with the AWS Amplified documentation here. So what we've got here is the async function sign up method, which we can copy paste to our sign up component or sign up page here. We will chuck it down here. Async function sign up. Once user auth await auth sign up, username, password, Email, phone number, get rid of that. Uh, we'll get rid of phone number. Attributes email, we do want. Uh, this method is going to take in a username as a string, password, string. Actually, what we can do, reuse this form uh, data, I form input, and we'll call this in the 
unsubmit. So we'll say sign up with the, nope. Oh, that's gonna be confusing. Sign up with email and password. We'll call that. And we'll say sign up with email and password with the data. Pass in to the form and we'll pass that down to this function here with the correct type as well. We need to configure AWS Amplifier with auth, which we'll do within the underscore app.js or dot tsx. I'll explain that in a little bit. We'll need to extract all of these values out of the data. So we'll destructure them. We'll say username, password, email is equal to data. Uh, const. Cool. Now we just need to define auth. Um, we'll also set this function to be async. And we'll say try do this, catch error, console.error, error. Cool. What we'll want to do then is we want to display something to the user if there's an error. So what we'll do that with is the material UI uh, toast. Um, we'll see what that comes up with. Snack bar, that's what I'm looking for. Open simple snack bar. And success snack bar. Let's get that one. I kind of like the looks of that. Get the error one. Alert, severity warning, alert. Uh, so we'll check that. Just the bottom of the form, I guess. Check that there. Import error uh, alert, sorry. I think that's actually maybe from a different library. Yep, so that's from material UI slash lab. See if we need to install something to get that. Your UI alert, alert props. Wait a minute, what? Snack bar. Alert. Oh, maybe I'm using the wrong thing. I think I'm using the wrong uh, copy paste there. We'll copy snack bar instead. All right, hopefully this works. Add snack bar to, I don't missing imports. Let's see if that works. Alert's still not happy. Alert. MUI alert. Material UI slash lab. Maybe we need to install a package here. Yep. So we'll go ahead and install that. NPM install material UI lab. Okay, NPM run dev. Back to our code. Hopefully, MUI alert from alert. Not sure why it's not happy. Maybe, I think, yeah, I think I just imported the wrong name. I'm not sure why it's saying MUI alert. We'll just say, get back to the docs here. What have we got? Let's handle click set open true. So we need a state value to say if the post is open or not. So we'll go up to the top here. We'll say once open set open is use state. We need to import use state. And we'll set that to false by default. And if there's an error, we'll set open false, I mean true. And we also need the, um, probably a state value for the amplify error. Oh, sign up error. Uh, set sign up error. And this is gonna be the message that we're displaying to the user inside that alert. Ring, nothing. Set sign up error. Set that first so it doesn't show with no message. Error dot message. Oh, sorry. Error dot message. And sign up error. We will set and close handle close. Eh? Um. Sure. We'll copy this function from the docs. Uh, 
on close, so we'll put that below. Yep. No on close event. If reason, click away return. Set open false. Looks good to me, and we'll just need to show the right message here. Um, so what we've just done is if if there's a sign up error problem with AWS Amplify specifically, so let's say for example they try and sign up with a username that already exists. Obviously, AWS Amplify is not going to allow that. It's going to come back with an error in this uh, try catch block here. And we'll set the message in state in this sign up error. And we'll set the open value, which is the value to show this alert problem here to true in this one. So that's going to show this snack bar for 6,000 milliseconds. And on close, we'll set the open to false. And the message that we're displaying, we want this to be error instead of success. The message that we're going to be displaying is the actual message that came back from this try catch block error here. Now we haven't actually set up AWS Amplify authentication yet to do that. So we will need to set that up now. So to do that, we'll go to underscore app.tsx. And what we want to do here is define AWS Amplify, um, which is going to be available on all of our pages. So rather than defining AWS Amplify here and then on the home page, define it again, we can just define it once inside underscore app.tsx. Now the downside to this is if you don't need Amplify on every page, you're going to be wasting quite a big import and Amplify is a huge import uh, as a package. So you're going to be importing AWS Amplify on every page. So there is a downside to this, but uh, just for convenience, I'm going to import uh, AWS Amplify. I also think I'm going to be using it on every page or every one of my pages anyway, so it's not that big of a deal for me. To do that, we'll import Amplify and the auth from AWS Amplify. And to do that, we will also need to install this package. So we'll clear npm run, sorry, npm install AWS Amplify. Cool. And then this should be happy now. Cannot find AWS Amplify. Let's close it and go back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's go double check that I installed the right thing. Not uh, getting started. You can install AWS Amplify, import Amplify auth. We'll just copy this code. Okay, it's really not happy. Um, I'll close it. Open it up again. Cool, now it's happy. Amplify configure, and this is a relative import to this AWS exports file here. So this is all the configuration for your project. You need to import that file. AWS exports, needs to be a slash here. That's a relative import to the AWS exports file. And you're just calling amplify configure with the config inside that file. Easy enough. Now to enable SSR, just server-side rendering support for AWS Amplify, you'll need to actually modify this uh, to set the SSR flag within AWS config to true. So to do that, we'll just spread the rest of the AWS config. So all that's doing is just saying, um, grab all of these values and chuck them in. And then we also want to set the SSR flag to true. So pretty much all we did there was the same thing as passing in AWS config, but we also added one thing, which was setting server-side rendering support to true. Now, the next thing we want to do is since we want this AWS Amplify authentication, uh, we want to detect the user in every part of our application. So within the home page, we want to know if the user is already signed in. Within the sign up page, we might want to know if the user signed in, or we definitely want to know when the user signed in, we want to let the, the rest of the app know that the user's actually signed up for the application so that we can uh, navigate them to whatever we want accordingly or perform some action. Um, to do that, we will create a context folder within the source and we'll create a new file called authcontext.tsx. Now, if you're not familiar with the React Context API, I also have another video on why you should be using React Context. And I actually do give the specific example of why we use React Context to pass down the user to all of the components within our application. And I give the example of AWS Amplify's user as well as Next.js. So if you want to learn a bit more about this, uh, definitely go and watch that video. 
it's it's a pretty quick one, only four or five minutes. So if you have a spare couple minutes to watch that and you want to learn more about context and the React Context API and how we're going to be using it, definitely go and check that out. But pretty much we want to use the auth context to wrap around our app tsx similarly to how this theme provider is so since the theme is being passed down to every one of our components here we also want to add an auth context or an auth provider and we want to pass down the user to every one of our components which we can do using the react context api now to create a context we'll say const user context is equal to create context we'll import that from react and we want to type here but i'm not going to do it just yet and that's it. We'll just say create context for now. Now into this context, we want to pass in some props, which is pretty much just going to be the children, children, which is going to be react.react .react elements. Now these are, we're just going to pass in the children to the context and re-render them wrapped around the context, which is all we're going to be doing. So then we're going to say TSRFC again, we're using that same import. We'll cut that, we'll cut that as well. And the React element needs to be imported from React. Uh, so we'll chuck that in there as well. Now we want to set const user and set user is equal to use state. And we'll also want this to be cognito user, which is a type that we're going to import. Or it can be null. Oops. And we'll set the default value to be null. Cognito user. Now this is a package from AWS Amplify slash auth. So I'm going to go ahead and import that. And you can see it has all these values that we can get, which is pretty handy. What we want to do is return the user context dot provider. And we want to wrap that around the children passed in. So we'll spread the children into the user context provider. And within this, you'll say we need a value prop. So the value what we're going to pass down to all of our components is the user. And we also want to pass down the set user function so that we can set the user value and update it across all of our pages from within an individual component. And that needs to be inside an object like that. Cool. This X spread children must be an array type. Maybe I don't need to spread out, just pass children. Use state needs to be imported. Uh, we'll pull it from the existing one rather than doing that. Create context is complaining that it doesn't have a default value, but we'll get to that in one second. But pretty much what we want to do here is we're going to use uh, the AWS Amplify Hub, which listens to specific events, and we want to use it to listen to authorization events. So users signing up, users signing in, users signing out, and then we want to perform a specific action every time one of those authorization events is detected. So to do that, we'll use use effect. And uh, this is this is from that uh that extension. Didn't really want that actually, so I'm <laughs> gonna get rid of it. Use effect. Effect. Just let me type it out without doing that. Well. Cool. Okay, so in this use effect block, we're gonna say hub dot listen. We're gonna listen to authorization events. We're gonna pass this function in. And we wanna say Form some action to update state whenever a auth event is detected. So to do that, we're going to say check user, which is a function that we're going to create. That's definitely not what I wanted. To do that, we need to import use effect. And hopefully it knows what hub is. Yep. Import hub from AWS Amplify as well. Now we need async function check user. And within this function, we'll say try const user is equal to await auth dot current authenticated user. We'll need to import auth from AWS Amplify as well. And if I delete that, we can see that that's actually recommended to us now. Cool. So if there is a user, so by the way, this grabs the currently signed in user on the client. If there isn't a user, this throws an error. So you'll need to wrap this in a try catch. And then within the catch, that means there is no user, no current signed in user. But if there is a user, if user, 
we'll set user to user. And if there's not, we'll do nothing because it won't actually reach this point. We just need to say this. Not sure why user is typed as any here. Oh, that's this user. Okay, that's a bit confusing. Um, we'll set const amplify user. If amplify user, set user, amplify user. Otherwise, there's no current signed in user. And we'll say set user to null. So this gets called every time user signs up, signs in, signs out. Um, that's anything related to auth because it's going to trigger a authentication event from this hub listener here. Cool. Okay, and then by default, we'll just add another use effect to say, just check the user when you first mount. Rather than having to check uh, just based on authentication events, we want to say, just check it no matter what, because we want to check the user is there or if they're signed in on every page. And now for this create context, we need to define firstly a type. So we'll say cognito user for the type or null. And then we'll say an empty object. Oh, can we just pass in null as a default here? And we just say null. I think that's what we want. Um, looks good to me. Oh, actually, that's not what I want. What we want is we want to. So that's not what we want because this value. Um, it actually has to be reflective of this, not the user that we said there. So this can't be cognito user or null. It has to be what we're exporting, which is an object um, that looks like this. So user and set user. So we'll have to create a, um, probably create a type um, or an interface. Uh, user context type. And we'll say user and set user. We'll copy the types of these state values here. So users are cognito user or null. Or null, null. And cannot find name dispatch. Interesting. But state action and dispatch. We also want to import those and then we'll say user context type is the default and then we'll say uh, empty empty object as user context type. And then once we're done with that, that is our context and we'll want to export it as a custom hook so that we can use it within our other components. So we'll call that export const use user. We're expecting it to be the user context type that we created up here or the interface. And we're going to export that as use context, use context and the user context that we passed in that, that, that we created above, sorry. Use context, we need to import that from React as well. All right, so now if we go back to our underscore app.tsx, we can wrap the auth context around our theme provider and all of our components. We need to import that, import default auth context. Cool. So now every page has access to the user as well as the set user function defined in this auth context here. And it's gonna be updated by this hub that listens out for every authentication event that gets triggered by AWS Amplify. So as we mentioned, sign up, sign out, sign in is going to trigger a check user, which will check for a current authenticated user. If there is a current authenticated user, we'll set that in state, which will be passed down to all of our components. So the user, the components we would access the user value up here. And if there isn't a current sign in user, we'll set it to null. So all of our components know that there is no currently signed in user. And we'll do that by listening to this custom hook that we've exported here called use user. So if we go back to the sign up page here, I've just noticed a small problem actually. We will need to throw the error here. Throw error rather than console erroring it out because since we're calling this in a try catch block, we actually want this to fail if it doesn't succeed so that we can actually show the error message with that console.error here, it would just be swallowed and it actually wouldn't show the error message that we coded up here. So that's just a small fix there. But if we go back to the login page and 
we try and sign in, let's delete all this autofill. We'll notice the current user is not authenticated. Um, actually, the first thing we'll do is import the use user hook. So we'll say const user and set user. Sorry, const user and set user is equal to use user, import the use user hook. And all we're doing here is destructuring those two values out of the hook. So user and set user is user and set user. So we're just getting those two values out of the hook there. And then what we'll do is we'll get rid of some of these, um, get rid of these console log statements. And then what else have we got? Console.log, get rid of the errors, clean that up a little bit. We also need to import auth. So we we'll import auth from AWS Amplify. And what else we got here? Uh, we'll say console.log signed up a user and user. Cool. Oh. And then the second thing we want to do is just console log the value, uh, the value of the user from the hook is user. And that's going to console log this value. So if we go back to the home page, refresh, value of the user from the hook is null. And as you can see, we're still getting that auth context error from line 44, which is a console error when there is no current authenticated user. Now, what we'll do is I'll show you what happens in AWS Amplify by default. Since we, uh, let's create a test account and see what happens. Uh, Jared, what's to that gmail.com, this password. And as you can see, we've signed up a user and successfully created the user. Uh, we'll go check that out in the AWS Amplify console. Where is it? Or we'll refresh. As you can see, I've been playing around a bit off screen. But this user that we've created is unconfirmed, which means we actually have to verify that the email is valid by submitting a verification code. And if we go to our email here, you'll see that we've got an email from AWS Amplify saying here is a confirmation code. And in order to sign into your account, you actually have to confirm that code with the application. So next thing that we're going to do is implement a uh, confirmation code functionality so that we can copy paste that verification code, submit it in that application, and then we'll be able to sign into our newly created account. All right, so let's go ahead and do that now. The first thing that we are going to want to do is is copy another text field and we'll say this is for the code so we'll say code verification code for the label and code we'll change everything from username to code just so it's consistent uh we don't care about the max length oh the min length min length should be six max length should be six uh your verification code is six characters long, I guess. Copy paste that. And then since this is erroring out, we don't have it in the type up here. We need to add a code string. What we'll do is, what we need to do is say, have a state value that says uh, const show code and set show code use state boolean and set that to false by default. What this is going to do is we're going to use this value to say if show code is true, then we'll show this auth item here. So this is just a shorthand way of saying if show code is true, then render this. Since if show code is false, then it won't read the right half because it doesn't need to as if this statement is true, both sides need to be true. So if show code is false, this, this grid item won't be shown. If it is true, then this grid item will be shown. So that's just a shorthand way of doing that. Um, so if we check out the UI, it won't be shown just yet. But if we hit that submit button down here, we wanna trigger a change to that value now, um, which we can do in the handle submit. So try, Sign up with email and password. Um, we'll need to actually return the user from here. And we'll say the return type of this function is now promise 
cognito user. We'll need to grab that cognito user input import, sorry, from from the other file that we created. So grab that from the auth context there, import cognito user from AWS Amplify auth. Great. So now we're returning that user and in this on submit function, we're gonna say, try sign up with the email and password, the data, and then we wanna say, we wanna await this actually and say, if it succeeds, then we'll set show code to true. And what we'll do is the second on submit will say, if, show code is true, then we want to trigger a different function. So we'll say if show code is not true, we wanna do this. That's kind of phase one. If show code is not true, then we just wanna sign them up. And then we wanna set show code to true. This is kind of phase two here. We wanna say, um, what do we wanna do in this block? We wanna trigger a new function called confirm account, which we can grab from the AWS Amplify authentication documentation. So confirm sign up here, async function, confirm sign up. And we'll paste that in. So try await confirm sign up. We'll need to pass the data in here as well. Um, so we'll destructure the data again, const username, password, code is equal to data. And once this confirm sign up is successful, we'll say sign the user in. So we'll get the sign in code from authentication docs as well. So const user is await auth sign in username and password. Console.log success signed in a user. And then console log the user. Mm, I wonder if that's reading the correct one. Hope so. I think this <laughs> this is a bit vague since we have the user value being passed in here. Um, we'll just call this amplify user and console log that instead. Just make that a little bit less conflicting. If I'm sign up, we will call that in this code. So if show code is true, confirm sign up with the data passed down from the form submission. All right. And let's say, what else do we need to do? Looks good to me. We'll also need to modify this button. So we'll say if the show code is true, we'll use a ternary operator. We'll say confirm, confirm code. Otherwise we'll just say sign up as it was before. Great. So let's see what that looks like on the UI now. I'll go ahead and delete the users that I've created. Let's quickly do that. Remember you can always do this via running uh, Amplify Console Auth to bring up these authentication UI consoles. All right, so let's go back to the UI here. All right, so value of user from the hook is null. Let's create an account. Jared Watts, Jared Watts, YouTube at gmail.com. This password signed up a user and now we can see the verification code field comes up since show code is set to true because this sign up succeeded. And now we can still see the user is not authenticated because we haven't signed in. And we'll copy paste this verification code to the verification code field here. And since show code is true, now we're gonna trigger this code that is in this branch here. So if show code is true, we'll trigger confirm sign up, which is here. And we're gonna say auth confirm sign up and then sign the user in. So hopefully, success signed in the user and nice. The value of the user hook is Jared Watts. All right, so we successfully signed in. And now if we go to the home page and we say uh, on the home page, we will also say const user equal to use user. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, but I'm just going to demonstrate console.log user. Got it wrong, but user. 
And now we can access the user wherever we are on the application, which is awesome. If we just quickly revisit the sign up page, um, so we can finish it off. What I want to do is add the Next.js router. So when the user successfully signs in, we want to navigate them to a different page. Um, we'll navigate them to the home page, I think. So we'll say confirm sign up data, which signs them in. Let's amplify user sign in, successfully signs in user. And we'll say router with the lowercase r dot push and slash. And we'll say if amplify user else throw new error, something went wrong, sad face. And we'll need to import the use router hook from Next.js. Const router, let's use router. And that's not the right one. We want next slash router. Mm. I think I'm doing it wrong. Maybe no brackets. All right, that looks good to me. So if the user successfully signs in, then we'll push them back to the home page. Nice. Now let's go ahead and create a sign in page. We're just going to copy a lot of the logic over from the sign up page. So let's just go ahead and copy the whole thing. We'll rename it to um, sign in. Shouldn't use uh, alternating in this just because it's a page name. Uh, we'll rename it to login. Sorry, it's probably more clear. Login. Um, we'll need the user router hook. We'll need the use user hook. We will need, probably won't need that. We won't need the, I will need a sign in error and set sign in error. Code code won't be needed. So on submit, we'll just cut this out. Handle close doesn't exist. We'll get rid of, oh, we will need that. Sorry, handle closes for the error that popped up. <clears throat> sign up with email and password. We won't need that. Confirm sign up. We won't need that. Value of the user. We'll just get rid of that as well. Um, we actually will need that open state. So we'll copy paste that from the sign up page. <clears throat> paste that back in. Um, so we'll need the username and we'll need password. We won't need any of these. So we'll delete the verification code and the email fields. We'll delete the email and code here. And what we'll do is just clean up a code. So we'll change that to sign in error. We'll change this button to just say sign in. All right, looks good. And then on submit, we will need to sign the user in and then navigate them to the home page. So we'll copy that logic from our sign up page. We have await auth sign in user. That will be data.username and data.password. This data, yep, it's already typed correctly. And if amplify user, same as before. So router.push and that should be good. So we'll on the dev server. If you're not already, we'll go to the sign in, uh, login, I believe it was. Make sure there's no errors. <clears throat> and if we open up a new tab um, and go to the Amplify console auth, just to check that the user that we created is um, confirmed so that we can log into them. Also, don't remember the password, so we'll see. User pool. 
Uh, we'll just need to log in. Estimated number of users is one. We've got Jared Watts confirmed. So my username is Jared Watts. I think my password was test password or something. Jared Watts, test password. And in, boom, nice. All right, so now we have the completed um, sign in and authentication process with AWS Amplify Cognito. Um, we'll implement the social logins later on, but now we have the sign up and sign in, which with email and password, which I think is pretty good. So we got the slash sign up page. Obviously, we haven't designed them as much as we'd like to, but we have the basics of the form and the sign up button and the login route with the username and the password to log in with. And then if we go to the home page and you open up the console, I'll zoom in a little bit, you can see <laughs> we're console logging this from index.tsx, user, user, and and see if we refresh the page, it's gonna be null initially because it's loading, but um, once the, the code is finished loading, we'll be able to access our user via the use user hook from anywhere in our application, um, which is really nice. So the next thing that we wanna do is implement some dummy data. So if we go amplify console um, API, we will now be able to log into that um, AppSync Playground that I was talking about earlier and start creating some mutations to create some dummy data inside our DynamoDB instance. I'll drag this tab over here. So now if you go to Amazon Cognito Pools down here, you can actually log in with user pools. Um, I don't know why there's two clients, honestly, but I think just select one of them and whatever works for you and log in with the user that you just signed up as. Now you can see we're logged in as Jared Watts. And if we go to mutations, we'll get rid of the query. We can add a mutation to interact with our database here. So for example, if we select create post, you can see the required input here is you'll need an ID, but that gets auto-populated if you don't provide one and you'll need a title for the post as well. So let's say, my cool post for the title. And it's erroring out because we're not returning something, but if you actually just press play, it'll automatically add the ID here. So I've just created a post. And if we go check that out in the data sources tab, go on the post table, click on items, and you can see the post is here. I've actually just realized that don't have <laughs> a, um, a contents value in this post model here. We've just got title, which is obviously not what we want. We'll need to add maybe an image field and we also need to add a, uh, a description or something like that to the post. But for now, that will be fine. And then we'll actually get to demonstrate how you can update the, the schema so it's not the worst thing in the world. And then if we wanna create a comment, we'll add create comment mutation. Whoops, sorry, you don't wanna do it in the same one. You wanna go mutation plus, and you want to click create comment. And as you can see here, now we've got two required inputs. One is the post ID. So if I want to create a comment on my cool post here, we'll copy the ID, put it in the post ID value, value sorry. And if we want to add content, <coughs> this is a cool post or a cool comment. And then if we want to get back the data, we can say, give me back the ID, give me back the contents of that comment. When was it created? Who's the owner, which is uh, related to the owner authorization that we set up in the model here. You'll be able to see the username of Jared Watts is the owner of this comment as I'm creating it. And you can also grab the related post. So you can grab the ID of the post that was created uh, that you're commenting on, sorry, uh, the title of that post, the owner of that post, which is just going to be me as well. When it was created, updated, what the post ID is, and we'll just grab everything that we can to demonstrate it. And we run that comment. Now we have created a comment on this mutation, on this uh, post, sorry. And as you can see, 
what we've got back is the ID, the contents, the created at, the owner of the comment, and also all of the details of the related post that we commented on. So we've got my cool post, the owner of that post, the ID of that post, and obviously you have the post ID, which is the same thing, but that's how they're connected. And then let's demonstrate the relationship between our data here. If we go query, we'll add a query and we want to get post by ID. So post ID is here, A3, whatever. And so that's the input to get a specific post. You just need to pass in the ID so it can know which post you want to grab. And not only can you get the ID, the owner title, all the information of that post, you can also then go down and select the comments of that post as well. So you go comments, items, and underneath the items, these are all the uh, individual comments that have been made on your post. So we go ID, contents, um, I guess that's all we want owner as well. We'll probably want to show the, the user that commented on it as well. So if we run that query, now we can see the um, all of the posts and all of the comments on each post. Obviously we only have one, one post and one comment, so it's not that exciting, but you can see how it comes back as an array and it's um, an array of objects that are in the form of comments. So pretty helpful stuff. And now that we have a number of data pieces that we can start looking at inside our application. So we go back to our DynamoDB tables, items, items for the posts as well. We've got one comment and we've got one post which is exactly what we want. So let's go back to our homepage in our code base and start trying to grab that data. So to do that, we'll go AWS Amplify Docs API on Google, just to show you guys through the, it's not what I want, GQL. Um, this one, we'll see. This is the one we want, the uh, library documentation. So, we can go to the fetch data tab. As you can see, we're importing the API for the types and importing the queries from the queries file for the actual queries themselves. So all you need to do is say, wait api.graphql, pass in the queries that you want, and you also need to pass in the authorization method, and you'll also need to pass in the um, any, any input values that you want. So for example, if you're getting a specific to do in this, uh, they have an example done here. You need to pass in the ID of that to do that you want to get as well. And if you go back to the API file that got automatically generated, you just see all of the all of the types that you can pass in to any mutation, any any query, or any um, any subscription. So, for example, if you wanted to update a post, you just need to pass in the ID of that post, and then you can pass in any of the fields that fit in within the, the post model that you created to update the fields of that post. Nice. So, on our homepage, if I can find it, here we go. What we're gonna do, I'll zoom in a little bit as well. What we want to do is get all the posts on server side. Um, since all users, and read posts in our schema logic. We can use the API key authorization method, which is the default um, authorization method, which means that we don't need to be a user to interact with the API, uh, with our API. We just can use the public API key that we generated uh, at the very beginning using the CLI. So we'll call some code to access our GraphQL API on the server side, pass it to our function as props, render the posts on the homepage to look like Reddit posts. Um, to do that, we'll need to update the schema to actually have some contents, but we can do that after we've figured this out as well. So as you can see on the documentation for Next.js, Pretty much goes through what we've just talked about. It says, if your page, if your page, sorry, contains frequently updating data, which our homepage in theory will will frequently update as new posts come in. Every time we we want to show a new post, the page will need to be updated. So you don't need to pre-render the data. It's not a blocking requirement for us to show the pages, uh, show the posts on the homepage. Sorry, for 
in order for the page to work. Obviously, if the pages don't come back, the posts don't come back, then we're not going to have much to show, but it's not necessarily a blocking requirement that we have that data in order to show the page to the user. So it says parts of the page can be pre-rendered using static generation, which will be things like our header or any text that doesn't depend on data on the homepage. And then you can show loading states for the missing data, which will be our posts. Then we'll fetch the data on the client side and display it when it's ready, which is kind of the comment structure that we were going through here. And the downside to this is that SEO is not as powerful because the data is not available at, uh, at build time or at, at compile time. And you're also not pre-rendering the data uh, onto the page. So that's the downside to it. But I think this is the option that we're going to go with because it's most suitable to the homepage for us. But if we go ahead and take a look at the other two options, the first of the two options is static generation. And for static generation, you're going to use either get static props by itself or get static props in combination with get static paths. Uh, we're actually going to be using these two for the individual posts pages. So we'll get into this in a bit more detail, but essentially the Next.js build command. So if you run npm run build, it's going to go ahead and run the next build command, which is going to create an optimized production build and go ahead and build out all of the individual pages that it can statically generate. So with these flags, you're kind of signifying that this page should be statically generated and you're going to have a function that says uh, pretty much go ahead and get the data from the API in our case. So it'll go ahead and get the data for an individual um, post and it will will make that data available at build time. So it'll go ahead and get the data from the post. It will build the statically generated HTML and it will display that static generated HTML to the user. And that doesn't mean it's just a static page. You can still interact with things uh, just like you would a regular page. It's just the data being provided is static and it's generated at build time. And you're using the, the get static paths method in combination with that, you would say, uh, provide a list of paths that you want to pass to the get static props. So for example, we would pass every single post ID to the get static paths. And I think there's actually a good example of how that works. Um, we'll say, yeah, here we go. Get static paths. So it's const paths equals posts. So posts in our case will be all of the available Reddit posts from our API or our database. It says post map and convert the post into an ID object where the ID value is the post ID, which is pretty much exactly what we're going to do. So we'll, post, we'll pass a list of IDs into this path, and then that path gets passed into get static props. And it says for every path, um, generate the statically uh, generated HTML or statically generated data, statically generated page for every one of those posts. So for example, it says, if the route is like posts one, then params ID is one. Our case would be the ID of the post. So it would be the data from here. So if we go to the post table, it would be post slash A39, <laughs> whatever. And then it would go ahead and in get static paths, fetch that specific post from the API, get the data and statically generate it and repeat for every single post. But we're going to do that for the individual pages, but that's not really suitable for the homepage because it's going to be constantly changing. And uh, I don't think it's a good option to statically generate it. The third option is called get server side props. And this is where server side rendering comes into play. And rather than being statically generated at build time, the page gets pre rendered every time a request is made to the page. So if I went to localhost slash. Um, I will just do the home page, for example. We could, in theory, have a function that says get server side props in the same same page as our home page. So it would be export default async get server side props. And then you would here say fetch the data and return it. And you would actually pass it in as props. Whatever gets returned here gets passed in as props to whatever other function is being exported within the same page. And Oh, we're not running this server, I don't think. Um, not sure what happened to our page. Hopefully it's not dead. Um, 
Sorry, I got a bit distracted there, but you'll fetch the data and you'll return it. And that is a blocking requirement for this data to be returned in order for the home page to render. So what would happen is these would request to access the home page. This get server side props method would run. It would ask for all of the posts from the database, return it, and then the posts would get passed in as props like this. And you would probably say like post.map uh, and then a Reddit post component. Obviously we don't have that, but that's pretty much a very similar flow to what we're gonna be doing, but this is actually a blocking requirement for the page to load. So in order for the actual user to be able to access the page, this get server side props method, get server side props method needs to resolve and return the data. And then this, this function gets executed where you'll be able to access the posts instantly. But that's not what we're gonna do because as it says, it has a longer TT, uh, what's it called? Time to first byte. There we go. <laughs> TTFB. So it says, when should I use get server side props? You should use get server side props only if you need to pre render a page whose data must be fetched at request time. So it's different to get static props as it's getting the data every single time that the page is requested, whereas get static props would get it once at build time. However, it's different from client side fetching as the time to first byte will be slower because the server must execute the compute request on every request and the results cannot be cached by a CDN without extra configuration. If you don't need to pre-render data, then you consider fetching data on the client side, which is exactly what we're gonna do. Hopefully that was uh, an, an understandable explanation of the three options and why it's best for us on the homepage to go client side data fetching. And now we can just get into implementing that client side data fetching. So to do that, I'll just get rid of all the comments that we made. All right. And pretty much what we're gonna do is make a request to the GraphQL API. We'll cut this uh, user. So I like to have my hooks at the top, but let's see what we can do here. So in order to get all the posts, we'll go to the queries file and we'll use a query called list posts. So we'll import list posts, list posts from GraphQL queries. And the way that you use this, if we go back to the documentation, uh, here, fetch data, it says const also do's is await api.graphql. So we'll copy that. Except our case is all posts. Await, uh, we'll wanna do this in a use effect function probably. Effect, clean up, input, don't want anything. Don't want that. We will, let's put that there. And I we'll actually need this to be in an async function and you'll need to, so we'll say const fetch from fetch posts from API equal to async um, all posts await API. So we need to import API here. API.graphql queries are list to do's. So this is not what we want. We just want list posts as the query and all posts. We need to import use effect as well. Um, use effect, put that at the top. Fetch post from API, return all posts. Um, so this is pretty much all we need to do, right? Um, we'll see if this works. We'll say const fetch post from API, and then we'll say, we'll have a state variable to store the posts first of all. So we say const post set posts is equal to use state. And what we'll do is we'll go to the API file and we'll look up posts, uh, export type post. And we'll get that. We'll set the type of the state variable to be post. We need to import that from API. So we'll say import post from API. Then this is not happy because 
we haven't defined use state, I guess. Need to import that, add it to the existing one, and we'll say uh, it's an empty array. So this needs to be a post array, sorry, not not a um, not just a singular post. It needs to be an array of posts. I think the correct way of doing that is actually this uh, post and then empty array, and we'll define that as an empty array. So you'll see this all post is actually not defined as a post array. So we'll need to return that as post array. I actually think that's not correct. We'll need to say as object. So this comes back as data and we'll need to say post array and then errors can be any array. Cool. So we'll return, we'll say if all posts dot data, return all posts. And that is now I will return all posts data. This should return a post array. We'll define that. Otherwise, throw new error. Couldn't get posts. Could not get posts. This is complaining because this needs to be a promise because it's async. We'll say fetch post from API. We'll say set posts equal to that. We won't do or will we? We'll say in here, we'll say set posts to all posts.data and return it as well. And we'll say fetch post from API. Then down here, we'll say uh, instead of, oh, we can console log the user cell, but we'll say console.log posts. And posts, posts, we'll go back to the home page, fresh, and it dies because we're not running the server. Rerun it, and you can see post comes back as an empty object because we defined it as that to begin with. And user is null, posts is object user comes back posts is still not come back yet so it's empty and the user comes back finally and we also have sorry the users still come back again but now we've updated state again so it's re-rendering and it's triggering the uh, posts which you can see we've got a array of posts so we've got list posts items and within that we've got our post that we created via the playground I think that we're going to refactor this a little bit because don't want all of this extra stuff. Just want the, hmm, how should we do it? So we've got data. This is data and we've got list posts. Probably want data dot list posts, list posts. Hmm. So this shouldn't be post array, sorry. This should be something, something query, post query, get post query, uh, list post query is what we're looking for. List post query. So this should be rather than post array should be list post query. We need to import that from the API. As you can see, that's matching up to what we were seeing in the console. Uh, if it loads, we've got list posts and then items. So this is an array of posts. And what we'll do is we'll return. Um, we'll return all posts dot data dot list posts. Mm, so items. And then we'll say as post array. And as post array here too. See if that looks a bit better in our console. So we've got posts, and now it's an array of just raw objects without all that fluff around it, which is much better. So we've got an array of all the posts from our database. 
and that's fetching on the client side. So this is pretty much a loading state that I was talking about. See, we've got a uh, loading state for the user, loading state for the post, but the user comes back, triggers a re-render, our post is still loading. And then the final outcome is we've got both the user and the post finish, come, finish loading and come back with the data. So now we've got all the data that we need, we can start creating some of the actual UI. So first thing, let's go to Reddit and see what it's, uh, what it kind of looks like. So we've got a post where we've got subreddit, not going to implement that. We've got the user, so posted by a user, however long it was ago. Uh, we've got the title and the description, how many upvotes it has, how many comments it has. So pretty much the format is just mm, title user and what time it was, and then maybe an image as well. So we will create a component, kind of replicate that. So we will go back to our page. We'll make a new folder within the source folder called components. And we'll make a component called uh, uh, post preview. And we'll use that shortcut again, just to get the boilerplate code post preview. And what we'll do is on the home page, we'll use the container component um, from material UI, which is just, we'll actually add that to the existing one. It's pretty much just uh, so that the contents of your page is not full width. So you can set max width to at least something like MD and that will, move it to the center of the, uh, the page like this and have these these uh, faces on the side. It's just a bit more natural to look at. I'll put that in a thing here and we'll say, this is pretty much the, the most kind of common pattern that you're gonna be using when you're gonna be mapping a list of data pieces into a component. So you say post.map each post, and then you wanna return a um, post preview component. Uh, import that from here and you'll pass the post in as a post prop. You also want a key as the post ID. And you'll need to import post preview at default. Okay, so it's complaining about not having React. So we need to import React and post preview. Post. So we need to say post is of type post and we'll pass post in as props. We'll need to import the post type from API and we'll say just return a div of the post dot uh, title just for temporary purposes. And now you can see on the home page we've got my cool post. And it's also kind of pushed into the center a little bit with the container component for Material UI. But now let's build out this component here. Um, what we're gonna do is use a grid container again. Uh, so this is just a flex box like we were talking about earlier pretty much. So we'll say grid item. And this is gonna be a container. Go back and get some little inspiration from the actual Reddit. So we've got the user posted by and the date and the title. So we'll say, we also kind of want this upvoting piece here. So we'll say it's a, it's a grid container, which has two items, which are in a row. So this is a column and this is also a column. So we'll have a, a grid containing column of items in here. So we'll have, column of the upvote, the amount of votes it has and the downvote, and then a second column uh, with the rest of the content. So we'll say grid container direction is equal to row. Spacing is, uh, I don't think we want any spacing. So we'll say container direction equals row. And we'll say grid item. This is also a container. And we'll say, grid container item again. So this is gonna be the upvotes slash votes slash downvote uh, button. And then this is gonna be the rest of the content, content preview. 
So this is going to be red item, which is, uh, we'll just, we'll just type out what we want to try and achieve the layout that we're trying to get upvote votes. And we'll say spacing is equal to one. We'll also want the contents to be uh, center. I think we can use align items if I'm thinking about the correct way here. We'll see in a short second. And the downvote button. I'll go back to the home page. So I have not done it the correct way. This needs to be direction equal to column. Yep. Okay. Um, that looks good to me. And we want the max width of this would probably be like star max width uh, about. Uh, let's go with 32. Cool. So now if you inspect it, um, you can see we've got this kind of, we've got the container, uh, the core container. Sorry, <laughs> we've got the container, which is the max width of medium. Then we've got the core container here, which is this parent grid. And um, underneath that, we've got the this grid, which is also, sorry, I'm butchering this explanation. So this is the grid container. This is the max width MD container in the parent component on the home page. I just close it instead of opening it. Uh, this guy, and then if you go to our post preview component, we've got the uh, parent container grid, and then underneath that we've got all of these items. And then, in theory, we'll have another component over here. So let's say rest of the content. Let's see if we've configured it the right way. Uh, we haven't, which is not good. This should be. Hmm, okay, that's not good. What have we done wrong here? Why is this? Display flex, flex wrap, wrap. Hmm, okay. Um, we will get rid of these container tags on these guys. Okay, instead of max width 32, we'll say 64. Seems to be too small. And then we'll say align items, uh, align item space between. Okay, that didn't do anything. I guess justify. Yep. Okay, and align items equal to flex start. Cool. So I actually don't want space between. We can see all the options by pressing control space. And what I actually want is flex start, I believe. But this is Hmm, this max width should be, let's just say 128, 128. Okay. And we'll say spacing between them. Actually, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll add some spacing between them. It's equal to one. And that should add a gap between the two grid items there. Let's see that's been added now. Bit of spacing between them. I'll zoom in a bit just for the video purposes as well, because it's probably a bit hard for you guys to see. Um, but what we actually want now is within these grid items, we want their own grid container for the direction to be of column. And we'll close that grid beneath here. We'll say, we'll see what that does. Looks good. We'll say align items equal to center. Hopefully that aligns them. Yep. 
And then underneath this guy, we want another grid container. And that is that. And then we'll close the grid container. Uh, this should be open tag. That should be that. We want another closing tag item here. And close the, what about I'm wrong? Grid item, am I missing? Missing one, okay. So pretty much what we've got is a grid to contain two other grid containers. So a grid container for the left side here, which is gonna be the upvotes, the downvotes, and uh, the vote button. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the upvote button and the downvote button and the votes amount for each post, which is gonna be that left side column. And this right side column here is gonna be the rest of the content within its own container. So this is also gonna be a direction secret column. And we'll say line items, they go to flex start. <clears throat> so now if we create another grid item within that, it should go about here. Great, okay. I think I'm gonna add some spacing as well. Just so it looks a bit cleaner. Didn't do anything, I don't think. Oh, the wrong one. Um, facing two. Yep, looks good, maybe even three. Okay, so that's the kind of boilerplate for what we're gonna do. Um, obviously it looks like shit at the moment, but we're gonna add some actual uh, pieces of the content so that we can start playing around with it a bit better. Cool, so. To improve the looks a little bit, we will say that this grid container has the same width as the parent, which is the medium width. And if we inspect that, take a look. Container with 100%. Yep, looks good. And we'll say, We'll get an upvote button from the material UI icons package. We'll say up, forward arrow icon, paste that into our code. We'll get arrow downwards, paste that into our code. And we want to get the, I think it's about it for that. Instead of saying upvote, we'll say arrow upward icon. And instead of downvotes, we'll say arrow downward icon, was it? I'll just copy it. Arrow downward icon. And we should wrap these around a button. So we'll do a material icon button material UI. See how to do that properly. Icon button, button, go to the buttons API, icon, button with icons, icon button. Okay, so there's actually a, a component for icon button. So we'll import that as well. Icon button from or icon button. Actually, we'll just see if it works uh icon button icon button nope yep import that and paste that up here paste that in there cool and uh, it's a bit hard to see but prop align items of grid must be used on container not sure where that is okay this guy Sweet, and we want the color of these to be. Does this have a color prop? Um, default, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, so that's the default. We'll say inherit maybe, see what the different options do. That's a bit, bit clearer. Um, we'll use inherit and wrong one that cool 
and we'll say install max width is how big is this guy? 24. Okay. I want it to be a bit smaller than that, so I'm going to say 16. See what that looks like. That didn't do a thing. I think this maybe pass that down to the actual icon. Yeah, that's a bit better. Max width is 16. Copy that to the second one as well. Sweet. Alrighty. And now we will need to add a votes field to the schema of a, a post, but for now we can just leave that there. And as you can see, there's a nice little buttons there in order to do something when we click them. The rest of the content will say, we want the title. So we'll say topography, uh, variant is equal to H2. And we'll say post, which is passed down from props, post dot title. But above that, we'll want, we need to import uh, that. And then above that, we'll want grid item. We'll say posted by post owner. And we'll say, well, that, need to, that will need to be topography. Now we'll say variant is equal to body one. Uh, cut that to be in here. And we'll say third thing is when it was posted. So posted at post dot created at. Now we'll need some kind of date formatting function to fix that. We have to compile, topography has already been declared. I don't know why it's not being recognized then. Okay, so there's a lot of spacing going on here. Not too good. Um, but we've got all of the core elements. Um, I think we'll need to modify this spacing a little bit. A lot of padding going on here. Um, what kind of spacing do I have? Comment that out and see if that changes anything. Nope. Okay. Maybe it's the styles of the text. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think it may be the line height actually. So we look into the line height. Yeah, we've got 1.75 for posted by Jared Watts. And then margin top. Oh, we've got a big margin. Okay. I'm not sure why there's such a big margin. Did we configure that in the theme? Margin, margin top. Okay. So we'll cut that, we'll cut that. And we'll see if that looks a bit better. Looks a little bit better. We'll just remove that from the theme. Um, we'll go to back to the index page, probably close all of these pages. We actually on the post preview page. So we'll go back to that. Posted by Jared Watts at. So we actually can just move this into one line at post.created at. See if that's happy about that second grid item element. Posted by Jared Watts at. And we'll make these bold. Oh, that's not how you make something bold. B. 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 And B. Um, like I said, we'll need a kind of formatting function to do that. But my cool post, and uh, we'll say give this a little bit of padding as well. We'll say style, padding, uh, eight. Uh, maybe a bit more, 16. Nice, okay. And for the kind of styling of that element, we'll want, we'll just go back to Reddit and see how they kind of differentiate their posts from the actual thing. It's kind of like a paper element, isn't it? I wonder if we chuck this all in a paper. Paper is a um, component for Material UI. Makes it pop out a little bit more and it also has a different background color inside our um, palette here. So you can see paper has this 1B233. 
that's going to stick out a little bit more and you can also give it an elevation prop uh, with a number to make it pop out of the UI a little bit more. Import that. Really hope this doesn't break my whole UI. Nice, that looks really, really nice actually. And we will give this, I think the padding's a bit much, isn't it? We'll say 12. Really nice. I actually kind of want these upvote buttons to be a bit bigger now. Maybe if we go 20. Maybe even 24, what they were originally. Just cut them. 24 seems like a good size. Votes. We need to add the votes here. My cool post posted by Jared Watts. Looks really nice. And let's say if we go back to our playground, which is here somewhere. Logged in as Jared Watts. Add a mutation. Create post. Title, another cool post, smiley face. Create that. I just need to refresh the page. I think this got a bit stale. Um, try it again, yep. And if we refresh, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we'll need a bit of a spacing. Um, we'll need to, let's say, just give it margin top of 16. Hopefully add a little gap between the, the posts. Okay, it didn't work as well as I thought it would. <laughs> Let's say 24. That looks lots better. Nice, this is really good. So we've got the all of the data coming in. So the post array, post one and post two. So we've got my cool post, which is the one I created first, and then another cool post, which is the one I just created. And we're mapping them all out on the homepage. And obviously we need to make a couple of updates to the schema uh, of the paste, the, the post, sorry, just so we can add the upvotes. Um, what else do we need? We need an image and we need the actual <laughs> contents of the post. So that's the next step for us, I believe. So the way that you can update this schema is just go ahead and update the file like you would any other file. So for example, we want the contents to be a string. This is going to break our existing, um, our existing post. So we'll need to fix that since we're enforcing this must be, must be, uh, included. You can't exclude the contents and our existing posts don't have contents. So that's going to come back and break our code. Cause it's going to complain that it doesn't have contents. It's not going to fit into the type. And then we'll have an image, which is going to be a URL and we'll say, uh, that's the wrong place for that. We'll say image question mark, which means it's, which means this is an optional field. Not every post is going to have an image, but we'll just make that optional. Alrighty. And what else did we want? We wanted, uh, we wanted, how should we best store this? We could either do votes and have that as a number, um, number, or we could do upvotes, sorry, upvotes and downvotes, calculate it. I'm thinking, I think we should do upvotes and downvotes because in Reddit, you actually have a percentage of how many people upvoted a specific post. So you'll see somewhere 91% upvoted. I mean, if you wanted to do that, you could not calculate if you're just manipulating one number. So let's go ahead and do it by saying upvotes and downvotes is equal to number. I'm sure if number is actually the correct type here, but we'll see in a second. Number, number. So these are both mandatory. And do we want to change anything about the comment? Um, I don't think so. I think the comment's all good. And the way that you can update it is by running, well, first of all, check if uh, the, the change is being detected by the CLIs by running amplify status. And you can see, I'm not sure why auth is saying it's updated but API is definitely updated. And I believe if you say Amplify API, maybe we'll just ask for help, see how we can compile it. You don't have to do this. You can just say Amplify push if you want to, but there's actually a command called Amplify GQL compile, Amplify paste. And this is gonna compile the schema and make sure that it's valid. 
amplify. Oh, I missed the API. Command amplify API GQL compile. And this obviously means GraphQL compile. Just going to compile the schema, make sure it's valid, make sure all these types are correct. And I'm not sure if numbers are the correct thing here. Okay. This is actually not how you do it. You don't need the question mark. You just leave this as is and you don't include the exclamation mark. So this is now an optional field. Not sure why I had that question mark in mind. I think that's a different, <laughs> different language maybe. I'm not sure why I had that. So by not specifying this exclamation mark, the end of a uh, string here can be string or can be undefined, I believe. Unknown type number. Okay. I'm not, I'm not actually fully sure how you type numbers in a int, 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 maybe it's int. We'll see. <laughs> but this is how you validate your um, GraphQL schema before you type amplify push. Obviously it won't work. It does run the GraphQL compile before it pushes. Cool, so it is int, looks like. And we can now run amplify push. And this is gonna uh, gather all of your changes and push them up to the Amplify cloud or the project that you've created. I sure want to continue, yes. And what this will also do is it's gonna ask you a question to say, would you like to update all of your files like the, the API file, the queries file, the mutations file? I'm gonna say yes to that so that all of our uh, GraphQL queries are updated and all of our types are updated automatically. So we just need to change this one file and everything else is kind of handled for us, which is really nice. So this is being pushed up to the cloud now. It might take a couple of minutes, but at the end of it, it should ask us if we want to uh, recreate all of our files here. If it doesn't, you can actually run a different command called amplify. Uh, we'll ask for help again. Not sure what the name of the command is, amplify API. Um, amplify, maybe it's amplify, I think it's amplify code gen actually, amplify code gen, and that reconfigure based on whatever configuration that you have currently, it'll reconfigure, ah, uh, sorry, it'll recompile the, um, the Queries file, the mutations file, etc. We'll go back to the main tab, just make sure it's okay. Okay. So we've pushed all of our changes. We'll run amplify status again. So make sure what's going on. No change, all right. It looks like everything's been pushed up. So I'm not sure if it actually asked us to recompile the queries and mutations files. Only it does, which is a bit weird. As you can see, we actually don't have the fields that we added. So we will need to run that amplify code gen command. Um, I haven't run this command in a while because typically it does ask you once you've pushed it up, but we'll see what happens here. Downloading the introspection schema. Okay, cool. So actually with the amplify code gen command, I've committed the I've staged the changes so I can show you the difference. So we've got the contents, the image, upvotes, downvotes added to the post, all the queries. Um, and if we go to mutations, got all of that added in there and the API, all of those fields are added to the types as well. And this schema file's a bit hard to read, but the subscriptions as well. So all of that stuff is added if you run the amplify code gen command. I'm not sure if they changed it so that you need to do that after you've run push, but typically it does ask you. Okay, so now if we go back to our post preview component, we've got this votes value here. And what I think I'll do is I will create a, actually just use a box, I think. I haven't actually used this in a while. A box component from Material UI. And, all right, it's on the other screen, uh, React box. Box, 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 import box. Not sure why it's not being detected. Add box, okay, there it is. And pretty much that just stacks things horizontally. Um, so you have typography, uh, votes. We'll give that body two. 
our variant body to. And the other thing we want is topography variant equals body one. And we will say, mm, what do we want? We want post dot upvotes minus post dot downvotes. Probably we'd be better off with a function here, but we'll say two string. Uh, add the brackets to that and we'll say two string. And close that off. Now this is going to break, so I we'll need to go back to our thing. I've got all these tabs open. Can't find anything. Uh, where's our API here? We'll refresh this playground. What we'll do is we'll go log in with our user again, log out with JaraBots, and we'll say, actually, we just need to go to the data sources. What we'll do is go to our posts, we'll add a field called upvotes. Sorry, it should have been a number, append a number, upvotes, let's say 10, and number, downvotes, nine ah uh, let's go two and for this one we'll do the same and number upvotes seven oh that's an eight oh seven and number downvotes 12. And let's see if it actually goes into the negative and if we refresh our page if we run the server again Let's see what we got. Uncaught error in promise. Let's see what it's saying. <clears throat> uh, errors, can it return null for non-nullable type string within parent post? Uh, contents, we're missing the contents. Um, what about that? So we'll say append string contents. This is the contents of blah, 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 blah. Can't be bothered to write that. And we'll do the same for this one, contents. Brush the page again. Oh, okay. So negative four and eight. I'm not sure why it looks like that. Uh, maybe we need to actually do a flex box instead of a box. I'm not even sure where I did that. Um, what we'll do is grid container, grid item. Grid item, oops, no, didn't mean to do that. I just lost the copy that I had. So grid container. And underneath that we'll have grid item number one and grid item number two. Paste that, we'll cut the box, cut the box, cut this guy into the second one. And we'll say align items, enter. Let's see what that looks like. That's not what I wanted. I want it to be direction column, column, if I can spell. Nice, that looks much better. Okay, I think I want this to be a little bit bigger. Um, maybe increase the font size to like 20 or something. Um, variant body one. What do I want? I'll say maybe like H6 or something. See what that looks like. Looks a bit better. So now I've got the votes being calculated. And if we upvote and downvote, we'll add that functionality soon. The other thing we want to do is format this date to be um, however many hours it was posted to go. Uh, that's going to be a pain in the ass, but maybe there's a, <laughs> a thing online to uh, convert that. We'll, we'll have a look. Good way of experimenting with that is just actually using the console. So if I copy this into the console here and I say, once my date is a new date and paste that in. Ah, uh, sorry, <laughs> new date has a space between it. Okay, let's just refresh, pretend this never happened. With that, const my date equals new date this. And then if we console my, my date, you can see it's been converted to the time that we created this post, which was about two hours ago. And if we say 
the date now is date dot now. We now have the date in milliseconds. Okay. Um, what if we do my date minus now? That's not what I wanted. <clears throat> I think what we should have done is now date new date date dot now. It's the function. So if we do my date minus now date. Sorry, now date minus my date is the milliseconds that has passed from when we created it to the date now. Um, so if we want the hours, we want to say like seven hours ago or something, we'll say uh, divided by a thousand to get the seconds. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. And that's how many hours has elapsed since we posted it, I guess, 1.8, about two hours, which sounds correct-ish. So we'll say two, we'll put this in brackets and we'll say dot two uh, fixed. Is that fraction digits we want zero? Two, okay, two fixed one. We'll just say zero. So we end up with a function that is like const, but date two elapsed time. Uh, obviously this is going to be really ugly and you would probably not want to do this, but uh, that's not even close to what I wanted. Uh, I need to stop speaking and thinking at the same time. Cons convert day to elapsed time. We'll accept a parameter of type number. Okay. I'm actually going to think about this a little bit more. So we want to pass in the string const convert to equal to function which accepts the parameter of uh date uh date this probably does const now is equal to new date date dot now and const uh current equal to new date out of the date passed in we want to say return now, sorry, const diff equal to now minus current. And then we want to say return diff, diff divided by 1000, divided by 60, divided by 60, prefixed zero. And then if we pass in this, say convert to this date, uh, what should that, um, get rid of that. Date not now is not a function. Uh, need a capital. All right. Date convert to two. Date convert to two, two. This. Nice. Okay. It's not the best thing in the world, but we'll just use that for now. We'll say, is that const, we don't need this function keyword, it's gonna be an arrow function, but date to um, elapsed date accepts a string and returns a string. So now minus current, it's complaining, ah, uh, dot get time, okay. That hopefully returns an int which it does, it turns a number. Alrighty, let's see if that works. Convert date to elapse, use that function on the created at. Convert date to elapse on post created at. Uh, go back to the homepage, at two, then we'll need uh, posted by, we'll get rid of the at, and we'll say, hours ago. Um, I don't think this needs to be bold. Posted by Jarbots two hours ago, posted by Jarbots zero hours ago, which is obviously terrible. And once it goes <laughs> past a few days, then 
gonna be like 48 hours ago, which is pretty stupid, but uh, without copying some code from Google, like something like looks like this, um, probably would be better off. But that's just an example of how you can play around with the values in the Chrome console if you wanna have a little bit of an experimentation. <clears throat> anyway, not important. Now we have that. And what we want to do below the title is we want to say grid item topography variant body one post dot contents. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yep, looks good. And what else did we add? We added upvotes, downvotes, contents. And let's say a user adds a huge content to one of the things. This is a cool post, blah, 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 paste that thousand times. Okay, it's too big. Try that, too big, and that. Okay, I think that was actually the wrong table. Uh, we'll go posts, contents, paste that a hundred times. See what it looks like on our thing. Hopefully it's demonstrating what I want it to. Yeah, so this looks absolutely terrible. And what I want to do is not have it look terrible. Um, pretty much wants the contents of the post to only have specific max width, uh, max height, sorry. So I'll say max height is equal to 96 or something. Um, I don't know if that worked. I'll say 32. Yeah, and now it's overflowing. So we'll say overflow Y. Uh, what else can we do here? We've got scroll, clip, hidden, inherit, unset. I think I want hidden. Yep. And what we will do is since this is overflowing onto the next line, I'm um, not sure why it's actually doing that. Why is it doing that? It's really weird. Um, what are we doing? We'll say, oh, uh, max width 90%. Cool. Um, still looks like shit on mobile. I don't know why it's doing that. <clears throat> uh, that's actually not the, oh, is it the way that I want to do it? Yeah. Kind of looks like shit on mobile. I think what I actually want to do is cop this to be on the thing as well. Actually, thing is, if the title is really long, then it will also have that same effect. So I want this to be 20%. We have that big gap there. And if we go on mobile, this is an iPhone X, for example, it still fits. Uh, we we'll need to fix that overflow Y as well. Overflow, overflow X, sorry, is hidden. I just want a little preview. Um, that didn't work too well for me. <laughs> um, is that just because it's one word? Yeah, okay. Pretty niche case anyway. Alrighty, so that looks a bit better. And in theory, if we want an image, so below the contents, we'll have another component for the image. So we'll say if the post image and and that's just a shorthand way that we've described before. We'll say uh, we'll copy the grid item <laughs> and we'll say. We'll use Next.js image. So we'll need to import that import 
image from next slash image. And we'll say image uh, source is equal to, have we got any available images? We've only got the cell icon, so we can just use that. We'll say slash the cell dot SVG. And the Next.js image requires a few props. Um, scroll down, required source with height and optional props is layout. So we want height is equal to, um, actually don't know what I want to put here. I'm just gonna put 500 temporarily with 500 and layout is equal to responsive see if this actually works and look like it's oh it doesn't doesn't show because uh the post doesn't have an image so we'll just flip that if the post doesn't have an image then show the image also not working um what if we what have we done wrong is there an image and it's just being hidden or is there no image um there is an image however slash the cell dot svg the cell dot svg what about favicon ico what if we just comment out this <laughs> this condition here what happens okay nope what are we doing wrong here slash favicon dot ico slash cell svg layout responsive is it not happy with yeah we go okay not sure why it's not happy with responsive um we'll have a look at what's the different layout options here so when responsive the image will scale the dimensions down for smaller viewports um intrinsic the image will scale the dimension Maintain the original dimension for larger viewports. It's probably what we want. So we'll try layout intrinsic. Mm okay. And that's scaling down for smaller viewports. So we go iPhone X. It looks pretty good to me. Um, I actually think this shouldn't be on the right hand side. I think it just goes below the, hmm, does it, what does it do on Reddit? Does it take up the entire width? It does not, okay. Takes up, okay, doesn't. So we don't need to worry about that. We can just leave it there. And we'll scale down the thing to be about 200 and 200. I honestly don't even think that changed anything. Okay. So that's just setting the item width there. So what we can do, we're gonna actually implement the storage so that users can upload the image and store it in um, in uh, AWS S3 bucket and we'll load the images from AWS. So the user will upload images and we'll store the link to that image in the post.image field, load the image source from here. But in the meantime, what we can do is unsplash uh, image API. Unsplash is a source, a site where you can just get random images. Um, so we get copy this link, you should get a random image. It's pretty handy for testing. Um, so you can get just source and just paste the link to unsplash here and it's going to complain that you haven't specified that unsplash is in the next config so hostname unsplash is not configured under next.js next config.js so we'll google that and we'll say next config.js it's not a json file it's used by the next.js server and build phases and what you can do is pass in images in here i believe so if you go create a next.config.js file and do this. And it's telling us that 
uh, and actually give us the exact link where we can do that. So we'll say images, domains, and we'll allow source.unsplash.com as a domain. Source.unsplash.com. That'll require us to restart the server. So it's found a change in Next.js config. Restart the server to change the effect. npm run dev. And if we go back to the home page, refresh it. We can get a <laughs> random image. Looks really bad, but um, maybe if we change the dimensions to be something more reasonable. Um, I wonder if you just put 16 by nine or something like that, more, more standard. It'll, nope. Okay, well, we can do some quick maths, maybe times 16 by like 20 or something. 320, maybe 16 by 30. 480, just scale up the dimensions a bit and nine times 30. Should have done that in my head, that was stupid. 270. Mm, kind of looks like shit, but um, what we can do is configure the dimensions to be something like what we just did. So uh, with 480 times 480 by two, maybe 960 and 270 by two is 540. So we'll do 980, uh, uh, 980 is the, the width, I believe, 980, uh, 540, and Google that. Cool, and it gives us a random image of that dimension. Um, so we'll chuck that on the end, so 980 x 540, a bit better. Nice. Looks much better. Uh, obviously it's giving us the same image, which kind of looks terrible, but um, you can see kind of it's just a demonstration purposes and it's scaling down because we've got that intrinsic layout flag here and scales down to smaller viewports really nicely. And our posts look really clean and responsive on the iPhone as well. Cool. Just going to make a few small adjustments to the styling here. Um, this 70% thing is a bit budget, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that. And then this with 100% is actually not required as well. What we should have instead is flex wrap here. Um, how do you do wrap? Uh, wrap is equal to what options we got here. No wrap is what I want. So instead of it wrapping onto the next line, I just want it to align in the uh, horizontal way. Let's see what that looks like. Fresh. Okay, it looks good. Yeah, it looks, mm, oh, it looks a bit better. If we go on iPhone, it's a bit, that looks pretty good, I think. Um, Moto G4, Galaxy, Pixel, looks pretty good. Pretty happy with the way that that looks. And then we drag it around, the image is growing. I think that looks much better. It's going to be a bit more stable than just having that 70% there. So that's just a small style change. And now I think we're ready to uh, start thinking about creating the individual pages for the individual post. In order to do that, we're going to add a link to each post, which when you click on it, it's going to take you to view that individual post on a separate page. So uh, what we will do is on this right hand side, we're going to go ahead and wrap the whole right hand side in an item from material UI called button base. And we'll check that at the end of the right hand side grid. Um, what we'll do is on click, we'll say, uh, what we want to do is router. We'll use the use router hook that we've used before. So we'll just search for that on router. We'll import it, import use router. On router is equal to use router. So we'll put that above that. Put the router imported. And then we'll say router dot push um, posts. And then it's going to be a dynamic route. So it's going to be post slash post dot ID. And well, if that works, then we should be able to click on this right hand side here and it'll take us to slash post slash the ID of that post. Uh, so that was A3. 
we go back to another cool post. We got one B. All right, obviously we haven't implemented that page yet. So let's go ahead and do that now. To do that, we're going to be using the Next.js dynamic route. And what this allows you to do is create a post that looks like this. So we'll go pages slash post slash PID, which I guess is post ID uh, dot JS. And this is going to catch every page that lands under the slash post slash uh, ID, whatever it is there. It's going to catch every single one of those pages. And you can actually grab the ID and do whatever you want with it by the Next.js router. So you can extract, uh, destructure the PID out of the PID passed into the URL. So once PID is a good router query, and then you can um, display the ID and do whatever you want, make a specific request, which is what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to actually use the static, uh, get static props and get static pars that we were talking about earlier in this data fetching part here. So get static props. We're going to be using this in combination with the get static pars method, which is further down here somewhere. Static pars. And that's down here. So we'll go ahead and try and implement that as best as we can now. So the first thing we're going to want to do is create a new folder or post. And that's going to be within the source slash pages. Sorry, move that in there. And the post folder. So that's the post. And what we want to do is go ID TSX. We'll use the boilerplate code and change this to be individual post. What we'll want to do here is we will go ahead and copy the um, go ahead and copy this code from the Next.js docs. And we'll see what it says. Actually also have TypeScripts. We'll search for TypeScript types for each of these. Um, all right, TypeScript, Next.js. We will grab the types required for these functions. So we pull out all of this. We won't need get server side, but we will need get static bars and get static props. And exchange this, get static props to be the TypeScript one and get static pars to be the TypeScript one as well. So you can see the comments that we've copied this function gets called at build time on the server side. It may be called again on a serverless function if free validation is enabled and a new request comes in. And then down here, it's complaining about something. I guess we missed it. Maybe missed a bracket at the end. Um, get static pause. This function gets called at build time on server side. It may be called again. Okay, that's the same comment. So we'll go ahead and delete those. And then we've got this revalidate value here. Next.js will attempt to regenerate the page when a request comes in and at most once every 10 seconds. But we will get into that why we might need something like that when we encounter the error that we're going to uh, in the future. So I'm not sure why this is complaining. Uh, it's not a sign to get static bars. Okay, I guess we're not returning anything from that function there. Um, Let's go back to the documentation. Actually, we probably don't need it. We can probably go from here. So in get static paths, we're going to start out with this. What we're going to do is think about all of the paths that we want to export, which is every single post uh, unique ID. We want to statically generate a path for each of the posts, or each of the individual posts. So in our database, we have two posts currently. Uh, so we want a path for this post. And we want a path for this post. So what we can do is actually, since we enabled the server side rendering to be true in amplify configure uh, over here, we can actually get rid of that unused import. Uh, we can actually run these graphical queries on the server side in these get static paths and get static prop props methods. And what that enables us to do is just reuse the um, kind of fetching data that we were using before. So we'll say once all to do's blah, blah, blah. Once all to do's is equal to, so we'll go all, all posts is equal to await, we'll import API. We actually need to do a step before this 
if I remember correctly. So we'll go uh, next JS anyways amplify. There is a step before this where you need to wrap the you need to wrap the context that gets passed in into a SSR value. Just need to find the correct documentation for that and set up full stack project. I can blah 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 connect. And down here we should have SSR. So const SSR with SSR context. I need to destructure the request in the parameters here. And then you say const SSR is equal to with SSR context and pass in the request like so. That's going to enable us to use SSR uh, and interact with the GraphQL API on the server side. It's pretty awesome. And then we'll say const response equal to wait ssr.api so instead of just using the api we'll need to use ssr.api and we'll import the list post query from our graphql queries file so const response is equal to await ssr.graphql and the query is equal to list, list posts Alrighty, and what we want to do with that is we'll go back to the next.js data fetching docs and that was a really good example of this something like this so get the paths we want to pre-render based on posts we'll actually need to um okay it's not happy about that for some reason we'll revisit that in a second as and this is something similar to what we were doing before so api as you can see we were destructuring it as data list posts and errors any we'll actually just go ahead and copy that from our previous file we'll say as this post query and we will import that type and errors as any. So we'll then destructure the items. So what we'll need to do is we'll say response. Well, actually, um, sorry, this is really jumbled, but we'll copy paste the paths mapping code from Next.js and we'll see what we need to do. So paths is equal to response we want to get the posts out of each thing so we'll go response.data dot list post dot items dot map and that gives us each individual post as you can see the type name is post here and we'll map that into the id of the post so that's pretty handy and then we'll return this we'll return only these paths at build time and then the fallback blocking will server render pages on demand if the path doesn't exist. And we'll explain why that's handy in a short moment. Uh, I just want to figure out why this is complaining TypeScript about not knowing what request is. Um, okay. Doesn't know what this is. Get static paths, async context. Doesn't know what's the West is here. Property request does not exist on get static paths context. So I just spent a little few minutes off screen figuring out why this is doing this, but pretty sure you actually don't need this. So you can just say cons SSR is with SSR context and then say SSR.API. We'll see if it actually works, but we'll go with that for now. And then within get static props, what we want to do is for each path passed in to get static props from get static paths, we want to get the individual data for that um, for that post. So for each post, we want to get the individual one, which we can do using the get post query. So we need to add that query, get post from our queries document. And then we go back to the Next.js documentation, Next.js data fetching. Sorry for going back and forth between Google get static props we would need to something like this and what a good example is is we will need to return the individual post okay so we'll copy this code for const get static props let's copy it and get the correct thing typing so call an external api which we're going to call the um graphql api and we'll do a similar thing to what we were doing before 
actually have a example uh what they're doing in this post is const ssr with ssr context request okay so we'll destructure request out of this get static props i think i actually may have copied the wrong thing so const ssr nope doesn't exist okay um so when in context and i think maybe the request const request is destructured out of the context maybe nope const request does not exist okay what can we get out of context params dot uh, so okay, so rather than passing the context here we're going to destructure params out of the context and then we're going to say const ssr equal to with ssr context with nothing again and we're going to say const posts query equal to await ssr dot api dot graphql and we'll copy this query again except we're going to need and uh, we're actually going to need the query and we'll say get yeah, post post and we'll say what else can we put in here we need a variables uh because we need to pass in the id to get the actual specific post so if you remember from the playground we needed to pass in an id to the get post query uh you can probably see that actually if you go to get post get post and if we go export type get post query get post and you need to pass in the id so variables id is going to be the params dot id and what that is is just destructuring the id out of the url and what this is going to do is we're going to return it as data and we'll say get post query we need to import that type mm, get post query okay the api get post query does exist I'm not sure why it's not coming up get post query list post query all right as ah uh, i mistyped it's not recognizing it and so then we've got get post query and then what we want to do with this is return the individual props so i'll leave this comment in here by returning props posts the blog component which in our case is the individual post component receive posts post and we'll put the return props um posts i want this to be post is equal to uh post query dot data dot get post dot uh just get post so that's going to return all the data from this specific post back to props uh, from our inside the individual post. So we need to destructure the post in props and we'll say console.log dot post uh, post. See if this works. I don't have high hopes. We need to add this as props and we'll say post type. Import that from the API. Um, let's see if that's happy. Maybe we need to type this as post. Cool. Let's see if we go to an individual post page again. If we go back to our Reddit clone, let's refresh the page. Home page is still working all good. If we click on an individual post, we'll get navigated to post and the individual ID of the post we clicked on. And as you can see in the console, we're getting the post back. All right. And we can see uh, the details of this individual post, the comments on that post, and all the contents of the post, downvotes, upvotes, etc. And the cool thing is, if we actually go to the 
Reddit clone directory and we run npm run build. You can see it's generating static pages. So generating static pages, one out of seven. Um, I'm not sure why there's seven. Uh, there's probably static pages other than the uh, two post pages, but as you can see here, this uh, thing is highlighted in uh, white, I guess, <laughs> just filled out. Uh, SSG is enabled for these pages. So we've got static site generation for post slash this and post slash this. And if we had another post in the database, it would statically generate that post as well. But uh, what what this is demonstrating kind of is just how it works when you run npm run build and it's generating a static pages and finalizing all the optimization. So it goes ahead and runs these scripts at build time. So it's actually getting the data and generating whatever is necessary to show those pages statically to the users. And once you deploy that, uh, we'll get into the deployment later on in the video. You'll see these pages are really, really fast. And something that tripped me up was this, um, this fallback, which if we go to the Next.js documentation and Next.js data fetching, and we go fallback, So let's get the, okay, so here we go. The fallback key is required and it says the object returned by get static pass must contain a Boolean fallback key. Now, if you set fallback to false, then any pass not returned by get static pass will result in a 404 page. Now you'll see why this is such a big deal um, once we compare it to the other options. So fallback is true. You can say then the behavior of get static props changes. The pass returned from get static pass will be rendered to HTML at build time. Pars that have not been generated at build time will not result in a 404 page. Instead, Next.js will serve a fallback version of the page on the first request to such a path. Now, that pretty much just means since we didn't, since we haven't generated this page statically at build time, and then so if a, a user created a new post and tried to navigate to that post, then since it wasn't run at build time, if fallback was false, it would just lead to a 404 page because the page doesn't exist. It exists in the database, but it wasn't built at, uh, at build time. So the page isn't available to display to users. That's what it, it would just result in a 404 page if you set it to false, setting it to true, leaves it in a loading state and it goes and receives the data required to show the newly, newly created page. So while it's loading, it would just say a fallback state and you'd say like, uh, while, yeah, if router is fallback, you just say loading. And then in the background, it will go ahead and get the, the, uh, it, will, it will, it will go ahead and statically generate that post in the background while it's in the loading state. And we've got follow black blocking. And so pretty much every time a user requests to see a new page, they will block the page from loading while it loads in the background. Now we could say we want fallback true and we want to show a loading state. It's completely up to you which, which one you prefer. But the first user that requests the page that hasn't been built at build time. So for example, if we built it now and I went ahead and created a third post, Next.js needs to build that third post if we're generating it statically. It's, it's not going to be magically available since we are compiling these at build time. So you can either set fallback to blocking or fallback to true but make sure you don't have fallback to false as if you create a new page, it's actually just going to 404 when you try and navigate it if you're using static generation. This is something that tripped me up and it took me a while to understand why my pages that I newly created in a previous project, you know, I would navigate to them. It would work completely fine in a local environment because this is actually not, not how it works in your local environment. I think it just requests that every, every time you want it. It's not really being statically generated and it was working completely fine on my local, but when I deployed it, someone would create a new post and it would just navigate them to a 404 page until I rebuild the entire thing. So a really important concept to recognize in Next.js. But in a nutshell, what we've done is enabled new pages to be generated when a user requests them. So by default, we'll generate all of the pages that are unknown at 
build time. So we know these two pages exist in the database when we built it. So those two pages are gonna be statically generated and automatically available to all our users. But when a third post comes along, when a user creates a post, that post, when the first time it gets visited, it will be built in the background. And in the meantime, the, the user won't be able to access the page while Next.js is building it. But once it has been built, all of the users will be able to access that statically generated page uh, in future. So when it gets built once and then the rest of the users will be able to access it. Now we'll design the UI for the individual post page. So to do that, we'll go to the post ID page and we'll start designing what we want the post to look like. So if we get some small inspiration from the actual Reddit, let's just get the top post. Maybe we'll get a post with an image actually. Um, let's get this one. It's probably not a good example. I've got some booties in there. Uh, let's go this one. So we've got the title, the upvotes and downvotes, the posted by and the time. So pretty similar to, to what we were looking at before. And then down here we've got the comments. So uh, what we'll do is, I think we'll actually, if we go back to the home page, we can maybe reuse the um, the reuse the logic for this here, and then below it we'll have the, the comments. So if we go back to the home page and the post preview component, we can actually just say return the post preview preview post preview and the post to go to the post. Um, we need to import post preview and we'll wrap that in a container similarly to the homepage. Um, max width is equal to MD. <clears throat> need to import container from material UI. And let's take a look at what that looks like. Cool, so now we're on the home page. I mean the specific page. We'll just leave this button base element uh, in temporarily and maybe we'll come back to that. But in the individual ID page, now what we want to do is start rendering uh, some of the comments. So in order to do that, we'll need a comment, comments component. And we use the shortcut from the extension we were using earlier. That's the name of it again, if you not familiar with it. And in order to do that, we need to pass in a comment of type comment, import that from the source API, pass in it as props, and we'll console log comment, comment, see what we got. Uh, it's not gonna do anything because we're not calling it. Um, let's render the comment.content and let's say, Underneath this, we'll say post.comments.map comment and render a comment component. Import that. This is not getting recognized. Import, okay, maybe not. Import comment from dot slash dot dot slash um dot dot slash components comment but it took me a while to figure out where that was um the property map does not exist on type model connection co model comment connection and i think that is because the post type here actually has uh comments as a model comment connection instead of a comments array so we'll say um uh, what will we say? We'll say post.comments, uh, post.comments as comment array. We'll try and get the brackets here to work out. Post.comments as comments array. Model comment connection is missing the following properties from type comment array. Um, Post of comments dot items maybe yeah yep 
Okay, so we actually don't need that anymore <laughs> since that's the correct type. So we just need to add the items there. This is requiring us to pass in the comment equals comment as props. So we'll go to comment. Uh, it's still not happy with the thing. Where's the comment? Okay, uh, comment. Uh, view, uh, comment, what do we want to call it? Comment. Let's comment, I guess. We'll call it that. It's for, because the import was conflicting from the API, so post comment. <clears throat> and we'll say post comment from post comment and comment is equal to comment. Missing key, so we need to add a key since we're mapping over things, so we'll comment the ID. And we'll get rid of this unneeded import up here. See what that looks like. Yeah, so we've got a huge comment here. Um, looks really bad, but we'll say, uh, what do we want to return? We'll return another paper. Um, we'll say width is equal to, sorry, style to width 100%. And obviously you could do other styling you want. It's just the way that I like to do it quick and dirty. Uh, we'll say max, uh, sorry, min height is equal to 128. And we'll say, uh, that's, that's it for now. We'll say <clears throat> it's a grid container again within this. So we'll use Flexbox again. Add that import there, grid item. And so spacing is equal to one. Direction is row. So what we want in a comment is, hmm, we want the user name and time it was posted and the content. You can also upvote and downvote comments. I don't know if we're gonna implement that. It would just be showing off the same, same functionality as uh, the upvotes and downvotes of the post. So I don't, don't know if it's gonna be that valuable, but we'll say, we need the username, the time it was posted and the content. So this is actually going to be um, column and we need two grid items, one for the username that posted it. So we'll say topography, topography variant is equal to, we'll use H6 and we'll say uh, the username post dot uh, sorry, comment.owner. And then we'll say, we need to use that function that we used before. Uh, so we'll create a lib folder and we'll say, this is just a helper function that uh, format date poster.ts and we'll extract the thing, sorry, post preview is what we want. We'll extract this function that we used convert date to elapsed, so format date posted, and we'll export this from here rather than defining it in the function, export default function equals, turns a string, date is a string, cannot find name date. Okay, what are we missing? Uh, this. Export default function convert date to elapse. Let's just say format date posted. <clears throat> and then on the post preview component, rather than calling that, we'll say format date posted, import that, getting tab. Cannot find what's it sad about. I think that's just an error. Format date posted. And we'll say import format date posted here and say comment dot created at and that code there. And then we'll say one more typography. Um, this is actually going to be, so comment owner. Uh, yeah, we've got the, yeah, I don't know about this uh, thing. I'll do body, body one. And we'll say, this is bold. And the date posted is not bold. And then we'll say, this is the actual contents of the comment. So we'll say body 2. Not sure how this is going to look. Variant is equal to body 2. 
Um, comment dot content. Okay, so looks terrible at the moment, but it's a start. And we'll say max height is equal to. Hmm, how does it work? I think I think the. Yeah. We'll we'll limit the max length to the comment, I guess, to avoid having a huge comment made. But for now, we'll leave that. Uh, we'll say padding is equal to eight, and we'll say. Uh, is this easy to read? Looks kind of okay. Uh, this needs to contain four hours. I think maybe just from this, I should just return. Ah, uh, no, fuck it. I'll say four hours ago. <laughs> four hours ago. That looks really weird with capitals. I'll just lowercase it. Go. And comment.content. This is. Full post, yep. Any, I think maybe a bit more padding. Sixteen. We'll have a elevation of one on the paper. Make it pop a little bit more. I'm not sure where this is coming from. Um, it'd be really hard to find. And uh, it's this guy. Ah, okay. Not sure how that got there. Alrighty, and on top of this, we want. A this comment, we want a margin on the top. So we'll say margin top is equal to, uh, let's go 16 pixels. Uh, a bit more, 32. Mm, do I actually want that on all of them? Yeah, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Yep, looks good to me. Cool, okay. And that is looking good. Now what we want to do is create a header component. Whoops. Um, we'll go to Reddit, see how they've got this nice header component. And if you're a guest, since I'm incognito, you can log in and sign up. So the way that we're going to do that is Material UI actually has a app bar component and you can just easily copy the logic of that into a component. So we'll call it uh, header.tsx, tsf rfc, and use that little shortcut. And we will copy paste this guy. Which one do we want? I like the looks of this. We won't use a menu, but we'll copy this as a baseline. So we'll do that and we'll say, Button menu, menu item, don't really care about that. Um, log in, log out switch. Log in, log out, I don't want that. I want no menu, that looks silly. And okay, so it's saying if, if the user is authenticated, then render the account circle, which is that, <coughs> okay, yep which is exactly what I want. Otherwise it will render, um, I think we'll say if not auth, which is actually gonna be if not user, and we'll use the user hook, user and and, and then if not user, we'll say uh, log in, uh, log in. Need to render some buttons there, but we'll, once user is equal to use user, import that, We'll need to destructure this rather than just saying user. And we'll say auth set auth, cut that out. Handle change. Don't think we need that. Handle closed. I think we need that. Handle menu. I think we no oh, do we need that? <laughs> menu. Okay. Uh okay. Yeah, we did actually need the menu there. Um nah, we don't need a menu. We'll cut that. The open false anchor false. <laughs> All right. So we're going to use this header component and we'll just rename that to header. Delete any unused imports. And in our underscore app dot TSX, <clears throat> we can render this header on top of everything. So we'll say 
it up. Um, that's not recognizing the right import. Hopefully it does. Yep. So header up that. Chuck him up here. The header. Um, I think the color. We can configure the color, but we'll just see what it looks like. This should render the header on every one of our pages now. If I can figure out where my thing is. Yep. So we got this header component. And if I go to the home page, we'll notice this header component. And if we logged out uh, the login and uh, login and sign up buttons will appear. So we'll have the login and sign up button similarly to Reddit does. And uh, I don't think we'll do a search bar. It's a bit, bit beyond the scope of this video, but we will need to make this look a bit better. So we'll change the color component of app bar to be default. We'll, we'll just have a little play around and see what the different colors look like. So default is white which doesn't look that great. We'll do inherit. Hmm. I kind of like the, this black color here. It's light black. Um, we'll say instead of menu, we'll get a cool little icon for our, um, for our header, for our logo. Which one do we want? We want, <laughs> give it the Apple logo. <laughs> kind of like that. We'll give it the Apple logo just for fun. <clears throat> we'll say come button and we'll say Apple icon instead of menu icon, get rid of that import. And we'll say icon photos. We'll say Reddit clone, clone. Maybe there's a Amazon logo. Maybe not. Nah, damn it. Anyway, Reddit clone and the profile icon will take the user to the profile in theory. Uh, we'll just flip this to demonstrate what I was saying. So if the user's not signed in, they'll get a login button, but obviously we are signed in at the moment. So let's create that component. Now we'll need two buttons and we'll need another button. Need to import button. Uh, yep. Import button. Cool. And we'll say, Log in, sign up, and this will be variant equals outlined, and this will be variant of, uh, what do we want? What's, what's it called contained? This needs to have a parent tag to wrap it in. So we'll just do an empty tag. We'll log in and sign up. I want the sign up button to be a bit more prominent. We'll say color, whoops. Color is equal to primary. Cool, looks good. So log in and sign up. And if we are signed in, let's say this will on click equals take you to the router dot push login, and we'll need to import router. So on router is equal to use router. Hopefully this comes up with the thingy. Yep. Fix import. Yep. Import that from next router. Then for the sign up button, we'll do the same thing. We'll copy this and we'll say router up push um, sign up. That'll take them to the login and the sign up pages. And if they click the, well, changes back to the correct logic. And we'll say if they click the account button, what shall we do? We can. Just have a menu button to sign them out for now. I think that's what I want. Uh, account. Mm, I think I actually deleted the logic that I wanted, which was stupid. Um, let's copy this icon button. Yep, looks good to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Copy that. And we'll import all the missing stuff. And we'll close needs to be copied. Probably all of this stuff as well. Um, I wish I didn't delete this now. That was silly. Anchor, blah, blah, blah. 
and it'll change gets deleted. Alrighty, looks good to me. So now if we click the icon, we got profile, whoops, profile and my account. Um, actually just want a sign out button for now. And we'll say on click, sign user out, create a function called sign user out. Const sign user out is equal to that, that, that. And sign user out, AWS Amplify. Get the documentation for that. Sign out. Await oh, auth.sign out. Make this async. Mm, we need to import auth. Okay. And let's try it out. So we'll click it. Not sure why we're getting this. Okay, never mind, sorry. We'll click it, we'll sign out. And we're successfully signed out. So the console say user is null. Looks good. And then if we go to login, takes us to the login page. We need a bit of a gap between the header and the rest of the content. So I'm going to actually add a margin bottom of 32. That kind of looks a bit better. This looks really bad when it's auto filled. I don't know why it's doing that, but anyway. Um, so if we go log into my account, actually think I got my password wrong and it's not showing the error, which is not good. What happened there? Not authorized exception, but the error didn't show up. So we'll go back to the sign up page, sign in page, login page, one of those things. And we're actually not setting the sign in error for some reason. Um, on submit, if amplify user, otherwise, bro, something went wrong. Uh, set sign in error. I don't know why I did that set sign in error to, um, well, actually don't need that at all. I don't need this if else statement. We'll say try catch error and then set the sign in error to Sign in error, uh, error dot message. Amplify user, we'll just delete that. And then we'll route or push them. User dot set user. Guess we don't even need that in the login. Yeah, let's try that again. Go back to my login page. Fuck that, it's annoying. Um, grab what's and I'll do the wrong password. See what happens. Get rid of the responsive thing. User was not authenticated. Hmm. Okay. Um. Doesn't seem to be happy with our. What's all the error? Error. Why is it not showing up? I think maybe this just needs to be out of the form. Um. Probably the problem. And uh, we'll just put an empty tag. Let's try again. It's not what I'm not showing up. I don't know why. Open is open. Uh, we're not setting it to open. Okay. That's open. True. That's pretty simple. Simple fix. Add what's la 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 incorrect username or password. If I do the correct password, I actually should remove the validation from uh, the password field as well. This is not required when you're logging in. Get rid of that when you're logging in as well in the username. And that means we don't need register anymore. Oh, yeah, we do. Sorry. We do, we do, we do. Otherwise the form's not gonna work. What we'll do is just simply register password. Register password, get rid of all the validation. Register username, sorry. Let's see if that's happy. Um, what am I missing here? Can I do something? Let's try it out. 
the um, card bots. La, 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 wrong password. Incorrect username or password. Correct password, signs in and navigates to the home page. And the, the header changes as you can see, which looks really good. So the next step is going to be to create a post. And to do that, I'm going to add a item to the header, which is if the user is signed in, we will also add an item with the plus icon. So we'll do um, icon button material UI and we'll do the plus icon uh, add. So I'm pull the add icon first, chuck that in here and go back to icon button, uh, react button component, icon button, just like this. Whoops. Um, what do we want to do? We want to chuck it down here. Delete icon. Instead, we want add icon. Oh, that's barely visible. I actually want it before the icon as well. Um, I want the color to be primary. It's a bit more obvious. Exit a few things. Um, sign out now we got add i think it's kind of hard to see honestly uh maybe change this to secondary or inherit let's see what we got yeah it's kind of hard to see but it'll do for now um we'll also add a tooltip i think it's definitely helpful tooltip material ui react tooltip component it's pretty much you just wrap it in a tooltip and go from there wrap that and close that off and what happened there tooltip need to import tooltip from material UI. import tooltip and we'll say add so now when we hover over it it should let us know that we're about to add something yep oh we'll we'll, we'll call it create post um create and what that is going to do is we'll take them to the create page. So we'll need to create a new page, but first of all, we'll do on click equal to uh, router.push create. And then we'll need to create a page for create. So we'll do create.tsx and add the boilerplate code here. Capitalize that. And we'll say, hey, create. So now if we go click the create button, it'll take us to the create page. And as you can see, we've got that. Uh, we'll add another container from material UI. And we'll say max width is equal to ND. What we want to do on this page is create a form where users can input the title. So we'll say create a form where we'll have title of the post. We'll have the content of the post, optional image of the post, and a button to submit the form with that, uh, with those contents. To do that, we'll use a, another one of the forms from React Hook Form. So we'll close all the other tabs, go back to the sign up page and we'll just use that as a reference if we get stuck on how to create another one of these forms but to do the just the basics we'll create another form and we'll close off the form uh, down here we'll have a button import button from material ui that is variance equals and and we'll say full width uh, do we want it to be full width? We, we won't say full width. We'll import button from material UI. We'll say create post. And what we'll do is we need to import all of this stuff from React hook form. So use form and submit handler from React hook form. Whoops, down here. And then we'll create interface I form input. 
we'll set the submit handler over here. Copy that. Let's unsubmit. Get rid of all this. Let's console.log big data. And handle submit. We'll need to destructure that from the use form hook. Um, do that up here. Let's register form state errors. And I'll submit. And then just to get us started, we'll copy the text field from our signup form as well. And we'll import the text field from Material UI. Add it to the existing one. So the idea of this is going to be title of the, the post. Post title as the label. Title, not tile. Uh, errors is errors dot. Title, we need to modify this form. So it'll be title, title, uh, content. What else we got? Title, content, an optional image. So we'll say image. I think this is where I got the question mark earlier. Confused. Image is equal to string. And we'll say title. Place everything. Username, title. Please enter a title. So it's required. We'll say minimum length of the title is one character. Please enter a title for, oh, we don't actually need that then since we've already got the required flag. So we can get rid of that. Max length is going to be 120 characters. Please enter a title uh, that is 120 characters or less. So that way we can't get uh, really, really long titles that will mess up the UI. And then we'll say another text field for the contents of the post. And this one's going to be the content, post content, type is text. And this one's going to be multi-line. And for both of these, we're going to say full width. So they're a bit longer, looks a bit more natural. This one's going to be multi-line. And this is going to be content. We'll replace all the title references to content. Please enter. Uh, please enter. Uh, is it required? I think it is required. Please enter some content for your post. And the max length is going to be 1000. I guess it's just a random number. Please enter a, please enter, uh, please make sure your content is 1000 characters or less. And it's going to be content. Okay. So now we've got two text fields. Let's take a look at what that is looking like. Can't see a thing. It's so dark. Uh, so I've got post title and post content. This is all going to be within a grid container. So let's import grid and we'll also create the grid container here. We will put it down the bottom and we'll import grid. Then we'll say spacing is equal to two and direction is equal to column. Okay, looking good. Um, the spacing is not looking too good. That's because these aren't wrapped in grid items. Uh, grid item. Got that. Paste that here. And do the same for this one. Wrap them both in grid item. So now they've got a bit more spacing between them. And you can see if this goes longer, then it's... Uh, it goes over multiple lines and if it's a thousand characters, it's not showing the error, um, which is not good. I think maybe if you submit it, it only shows the error. So try that. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. We've got post title, post content. And now we want to add the image. To add the image, we're going to use a library called React Drop Zone. And it actually gives quite a good example of how you can uh, have a file uploaded. So you drag and drop some files, so upload my image, and it'll give you a nice little preview of that file and you can access the file. And we're gonna upload the file to a S3 bucket. So we're gonna go ahead and install the React Drop Zone package. So if you go to React Drop Zone, we'll install it by running npm install dash save React Drop Zone. And what we'll do is we'll go back to that example. So it was the reviews example. 
and we'll just copy this whole thing and we'll create a component for image drop zone dot tsx paste the code that we've copied in drag and drop some files style get a thumbs container okay um what we'll need to do is What's this complaining about? Um, property comes from property star, which is declared. Okay, whatever. Um, I think probably just spread it in. It's probably gonna fix it, maybe. But it's not that important. We will make our own custom one once we get this working. Um, we'll need to make it work with Material UI. So to do that, we will use the use styles hook uh, use styles we'll copy that from the header here and we'll copy that to the image drop zone say use styles we'll need all of the imports we'll copy those across as well and then down here we'll say function previews uh, const classes equal to use styles and We'll say style, we'll just say class name, go to classes dot thumb. Um, we need to copy all of these into the use styles hook rather than having them separate constants. So we'll do that. We'll change this to thumb, we'll change that to the value of thumb. Then we will, um, but thumb inner, change that, change that to a comment. And the last one is image. Let's cut that and we'll make it image. Get rid of all this shit. Yeah, looking much better now. Now we'll do star is class name. Whoops, class name equal to classes dot thumb inner. Style, class name, we do classes dot image and style last name last name name dots sorry class names equal to classes dot um shit which one was it um container we'll just double check that it was thumbs container cool Alrighty. so if we import that in our create page so we go over here, we'll say create, uh, sorry, image drop zone, not what it's called. It's called, um, where is it? From previews, image drop zone, spot default function. We we'll need to export this. So we'll say export default. And we will import it. I think that worked. Image drop zone from components. That. And we'll save. We'll see what it looks like. We need to run the server again. Syntax error. Unexpected token. Uh, that needs to be a, set, a colon, not an equals. Um, in a needs to be a colon not a equals. This needs to be a colon not a equals. And that one's good. Drag and drop some files or click to select files. Okay. Got that working. I kind of want to change the styles up a little bit. So I will say section class name container. Style equal border. Uh, border style. What can we pass in here? Dotted. And border width is two. Border color. Uh, let's just do a white one. That looks pretty bad. I think it's dash that I want. Border width is two. And we want that to have a bit of a space around it. So we'll do grid item. We'll also do that for the button. Drag and drop some files. 
Okay, maybe I don't want the button to have that. So we'll have a bit more spacing. I think I'm going to go with three, or maybe even four spacing on this. Looks a bit better. And then we'll add some height to it. So we'll say uh, min height is equal to 128. Looks a bit better. So if you click it, upload a file, and you have a preview. Uh, looks pretty bad, but <laughs> um, I think what we need to do is we need to have some kind of state in the parent component that stores the image. And so what we'll do from there, revoke object URL. What the heck is going on here? Make sure to revoke the data URIs to avoid memory leak. The files for each file. Okay, so we need to play around with the logic of this a little bit. Uh, obviously I only want one file, so we need to change that. And then we need to add some stateful logic to the parent component to manage how, how it knows what, what, uh, what image is being uploaded here. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's just, um, kind of figure out what, what this code's actually doing here. So I've got the thumbnail, which is equal to files dot map, uh, file, last name, thumb, e is equal to the file dot name. So this is the preview, uh, I'm guessing. Preview of the file. Yep, file.preview, okay. So I'll just make a little comment there, file preview. And this is a use effect that changes whenever the files changes. So that is making sure the files url.revoke object url. I don't really know what that's doing, but we can figure it out, I guess. Um, then this const get root props, get input props, use drop zone. I think this is just a unique thing to use drop zone. Accepted files, file, object assigned file, preview, create object URL out of the file. Okay, that makes a bit more sense. So as the files get accepted, we're creating an object URL and we set that as the file state. Uh, so it's actually an array. So this should be just, strings since I only want one. Um, and then if we go back to the documentation, it should be accepting specific number of files. So we'll say max files is one is what I want. The const accepted files. And where do we pass that? Accept. Let's use drop zone. Max files. Uh, one. And accept files on drop on drop equal to accepted files. Okay. Just want the accepted file to be set file. So we'll change files to singular file, set file. And instead of this, we'll say uh, let's get a better example. Whoops, did not mean to do that. Back to this. Let's see, on drop. Get a basic example. On drop, except the files on map. That's not what I want. I only want one file. So rather than having multiple files, we'll just get the first file and we'll say accept the files. And we'll say set file. Accepted files. Actually, I want the URL, so keep that logic. URL.create object URL. So we'll set set file to the first file. So accepted file zero. What I'm gonna go with. Not really sure how to limit that to um one file there, but I think that's an okay way of doing it. Probably not the best, but if the user drags in multiple, then we'll just grab the first one, I guess. And then the thumbs becomes something that we're going to delete and change. Files becomes, make sure to revoke the data your eyes to avoid memory leaks. So we'll just say, as file changes, we will, file dot preview. Preview does not exist on type string. So this is obviously not a string. File, it's possibly undefined. 
What is a file? Is it of type file? Can you actually say file here? Maybe you can. File. Capital. Nope. Okay. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Argument of type string is not assignable to parameter of type. Argument of type string. Okay. Um, accepted file zero. Dot. Uh, yes, maybe. Create URL object. And then I don't really know what this does. I'm just going to delete it. And we'll get rid of that as well. What we want to do is just say console.log file current file is file. And we'll go back to the Reddit clone. We will upload a file. Current file is blob that. Okay, which is correct. Current file is that. And if we change the file, Current file is this, which is not true. Okay, <laughs> not looking too good. Um, blob, HTTP, okay, so it does update, nice. So now what I want to do is when there is a file, I'll say if, hmm, actually, Drag and drop, drag and drop the image you want to upload for your post. And we'll give this some um, kind of padding, padding, and we'll say Actually, put a typography in here instead of a e tag, and we need to import typography. And we'll say variant is equal to h. Ooh, so yeah, we'll just do body one. Variant body one, drag the image you want to upload your post. Looks a bit better. Uh, I'm actually going to change this pad border width to one. Mm, looks okay. We'll change this to be. FA, 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 bit darker. Yeah, okay. Border color. Maybe I'll change it to be RGBA. Uh, 255, and the opacity is 0 0.8, 0 0.5. Looks a little bit nicer. Drag the Image you want to upload for your post. Drag it in. Uh, we'll go to pictures. And we'll just get this guy. Yeah, the current image is this. This looks good. So now we just need the preview. Um, so we'll need to say if the user has dragged in an image. So if file. Uh, no, you can't do that, can you? You say. File, question mark. Uh, fuck, this is not gonna work. What do I wanna do? I'll say, <laughs> empty tag. That's right, this is a rough, rough part of the video. We'll say, file. Otherwise, we'll do something different. We'll say, put this in brackets. And otherwise, We'll say a preview of the image, which we do by getting the preview item out. Uh, previews, we'll say preview, preview, preview. Source is filed up preview. Okay, we'll just try that. Image, source, filed up preview. Oh uh, God, it's not going to work, is it? And um, close that off. Okay, file up preview, property preview does not exist on string. Um, what if I just said file? 
so refresh. And this is the wrong way around, so no file. Then we want that. Otherwise, nice. Okay, it actually works. Delete. And we'll say uh, with 100%. Oh god, that looks terrible. Um, maybe not. We'll just say, uh, we'll do a div. Uh, we'll do a grid actually, a grid container. And yeah, we'll center it as well. So grid container align items center, justify center. Import grid. And we'll say this is a grid item. We'll say this is column, direction is equal to column. And we'll say grid item, we'll add another grid item. And within that, we'll say topography, mm, image, your image, variant six. And then we'll say 50%. Your image, that looks awful. I um, don't know why. Oh, 50%. Uh, not what I want. I want it to be in the middle. With auto. That looks pretty good. Alrighty. And let's try with a tiny image. See what that does. That's a pretty big file here, actually. We'll drag that in. Your image. Fresh. Uh, what about this one? Pretty big image, so it doesn't look that great on big images. I would say, we'll say max height is equal to three. Three, uh, yeah, three. Oh, 320. Mm, yeah, that's about it, I think. And we'll add a spacing here. We'll space spacing is one. Cool. All right, now we just need a way of setting this state so what we want to do actually is have this file managed by the create so we'll say let's file set file and then we'll pass this down as props to the image drop zone so we'll say interface props don't think you need that and then we'll say file set file and we'll pass this down file set file these are got props. What we'll do is pass down. Um, it doesn't know what set state is, so I need to import set state. And React Dispatch, copy this type from set file. Set that there. And then file should be string. Alrighty. And I guess we're not using classes, so we can get rid of all this. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And now the state is now managed by this parent component. And oh, we need to pass this down to the component here. So I was going to file, set file, it's equal to set file. Now in the parent component, we can cut that and say the current file as the parent is aware. is undefined and now if we upload one parent file as the parent is where is that so now we've got this state managed by the parent component and we're passing down the file and set files props to the image component the the image drop zone component and that way we'll be able to upload a image alongside our post to the s3 bucket so let's try and implement that now. So in order to add storage to our application, we'll need to run amplify console, uh, amplify add storage. And we'll be storing content, images, audio. Yep. Friendly name for the resource. We will just call it uh, Reddit clone images. Bucket name, draw. Sure. Auth and guest users. Okay. Uh, auth and guest users, because I guess guest users will want to have read access at least. What kind of access do you want for authenticated users? So 
So we want right update read delete. And well, guess users, we only want read. Do you want to add a Lambda trigger for your S3 bucket? I don't believe so. Auth configuration is required, but is not configured properly. Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound good. So hopefully this doesn't cause us too much grief, but we'll run amplify push to add amplify storage to our application. So you can see we've created the storage there. And for some reason we've updated auth somehow again. All right, so it seems to be done. So let's go amplify console. And we're gonna amplify console again. And as you can see, we've added file storage. So if you file stored in S3 bucket, do an S3. And we don't have anything yet, but let's try and link up our form to the S3 bucket. So I've just realized a small problem in our image drop zone code is that we don't actually have access to the file itself since we're sitting, we're setting the uh, object URL to the file. So what we'll need to do instead is just pass in accepted file zero and this won't be a string anymore. Uh, I'm not sure what type it will be just yet, but we'll change it to be any. And except the file zero, argument of T is not assignable, that state string, so this is gonna be any. And in the create page, we will say any just for the time being. And except the files T, okay. So T extends file. Accepted files is an array of T. So we will say file can be typed file and we'll say set state action of file. In a in the parent, this will need to be file. And we'll set the set file to the actual file itself. And then this will need to be file.preview. Okay, file. Um, what have we done? We've changed it from URL, oh, we'll just copy the code that we had originally. So URL, create object URL. And we'll say URL to create object URL out of the file. And then preview. Okay, let's try that. Just the raw object URL. See if that still works. Need to run the server again. This is just changing it from the, the URL to the actual file itself because we'll need the file to upload to S3. So it's just a small change and hopefully it works. So we'll upload my image and it looks like it's worse. Worked, sorry. So we've got the name and we've got the size, the type, and we've got the actual file itself. So now we'll be able to upload this file to S3 bucket. So if we go to create and in the on submit button, we'll say type is equal to submit. And then in the on submit handler, we'll get console.log the file. So let's create post. This is required. Looks good. Create post. And I'll get rid of this current uh, console log. So we'll say we've got the title and we've got the content and we've got the file here. Um, I actually don't need the image here. We'll cut that and we'll handle it separately from the React hook form. So as you can see, we've got the content, we've got the title. And before that, we console log the uh, image that got uploaded. So we'll need to handle first, we'll say if there is a file, that means use the uploaded file. Um, we'll need to send a request to upload to an S3 bucket. All right, so the way we do that is we'll go to the browser upload section of the upload files in the AWS Amplify storage docs. So we got once files, you go to e.target.files, and we'll try await storage.put file name file. 
So we'll copy this section of the code. I'll say try await storage. So we need to import storage. Uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Import storage, getting started. Import storage from AWS Amplify. So we'll copy that. Get rid of auth and get rid of Amplify. So we've got storage. Now we'll need this. So we'll copy that up to the top just so we can see what's going on. So if file, user uploaded a file, we'll need to trigger this. Send a request to upload to the S3 bucket. So try await storage.put file.name and the file. I think this is going to actually be the, the name of the file that we put, which I don't want. I want a random, uh, random UID, I think. So maybe I can ignore that. Um, storage.put, we'll check the docs to see if we can upload a file with a gen auto-generated uh, ID maybe. File.name, file. Doesn't look like we can. What else can we do here? Test.txt, so it looks like you have to give it a name. Uh, what I'm gonna do is probably import a library called UUID. Uh, UUID, npm. So I'll install UUID and we will just generate a unique identifier for the file name because I don't want uh, conflicting files to be uploaded. So we'll import before as your UUID and then we'll say UID v4, call that function. And as you can see, it generates something that looks like this, uh, just a really unique identifier pretty much. So we'll say UID v4, and then the second parameter is the actual file itself, image.png, sure. Ooh, image.png, not sure if that's gonna work for GIFs, so we will comment it out for now. Um, and then we'll say, what happens if we just leave it as is? We'll say if file, wait storage, dot put, and we'll say, upload the image, clear the console again. We need to run the server because we installed another package. So post title, post content, upload an image, great post. And if we go to our objects in S3, um, and we refresh maybe, not sure what happens in our catch, console log error, uploading file, we'll just change that to error quickly. So it does look like it's uploaded. So we've got public and the UID. Alrighty, um, so what if I open it? It downloads a file that doesn't look like what I want. Um, maybe we need to add PNG on the end of it. I'm not sure how we're gonna handle that just yet, but what if I downloaded it and change the file extension to PNG and we view it? We can, okay. So hopefully that works in our code. So we've uploaded it. We will also create a new post. So we upload it create a new post. So once that's done, once the file is uploaded, we'll also store this in, so we'll say const image path equal to UUID v4, and then we'll say image path so we can reuse that value. And then we'll say await API. So we need to install API, uh, import, sorry, API from AWS Amplify. Wait, API dog. Um, We'll get it, we'll get the existing code just so it's a bit easier. Wait API, blah, blah, blah. Uh, once the upload is finished, we'll say await API. const create post, mm, create new post is equal to await API. Query is create post from GraphQL mutations. So if we go into this, we see we have to have input which we can actually create another variable for. So we'll say create no, uh, create new post input. 
and type it as create post input, uh, I believe. We'll check. We've got ID, title. We definitely need the ID. Um, there's also some other types. So we'll say create post and see what we get. We've got create post mutation variables. So we've got the input. And that is of type create post input. And what it comes back as is this create post mutation here. So we'll import all of these three types. So we'll say create post input, create post mutation, and create post mutation variables. So create new post input, const create new post mutation variables uh, is create post mutation variables. And this comes back as a create post uh, mutation as, I don't think it's data. I'm not sure if it's data. We'll see how that goes as create post mutation, create new post, query, create post. And the variables is input. I actually don't think we need this variables because we kind of know what it is. We just need the input and we're not gonna have a condition. So don't need to explicitly say that. So we'll just say const create new post input. And this has to be, uh, it has to contain an ID, which is going to be the image path that we created. Uh, no, it's not, sorry. Um, we'll need, we don't actually need the ID. Uh, I'm not sure why I said that. <laughs> the ID will be auto generated, but the image will be the UI, the, the UID that we generate. So then we'll set that the image path. We'll set the title to the data.title and the content to data.content. And what gets auto-generated is the created at and updated at and the owner. And we can actually just jump in to it's not assignable to image any. Object literal me. Not sure what's going on here. Contents, sorry, not content. Contents and image, contents, title, and we'll need to set upvotes and downvotes. So we'll initialize those as zero, downvotes, zero. And I think that should be it. ID, title, contents, image, downvotes, upvotes, and the rest of it will be created. So now we can just set this as input, create new post input as create post mutation. And if we console.log new post created successfully, and we'll say create new post. And then we will say router.push post slash. Ooh, okay. Uh, here's where we'll need to access the create new post dot create post dot ID. And we'll need to import the router so we can navigate the user to the created post that they made. So const router is good to use router, import that from next router. And that's also a function or a hook. And we'll cut that on use import as well. So now what we're doing is we're uploading the image or the image file. And then once that's done, we'll start creating the actual post itself. And we're referencing the image that we uploaded in the S3 bucket. So we'll be able to get this S3 by, uh, this image, sorry, by downloading the file from S3 by the path, by the key. And then once that's created, we'll push them to the newly created post. Let's test that out if it works now. We'll go to, so many tabs open, we'll go to the Reddit clone, refresh it, we'll say, my new post with an image, my awesome content. And then we'll add this weird random image of another app that I created, click create post and error uploading file. What's the error? Unauthorized, not accessed. Ah, okay. So this is a problem with the default uh, authorization method that we set to API key. Uh, I'll see if I can find it in the configuration. 
So in the backend config, we've got the default authentication is set to API key. And the way that we fix that is by passing the auth mode. And we can set here, there's a number of authorization modes that you can create posts with. So that, that validates our rules that non-signed in users can't create posts, even though we are signed in, but we're not, we're not uh, telling the API to use the current signed in user so we can actually uh, recognize who's uploading this post. Um, so we will create the post with the authorization mode, uh, Amazon Cognito user tools. Whoops. And then it's going to complain because Amazon Cognito user pools is not assignable to type GraphQL auth mode. And this is just a, a uh, bug with AWS Amplify. So the way that we fix that is we type import GraphQL auth mode from at AWS Amplify API. And then instead of the hard coded string, we'll say GraphQL auth mode dot Amazon Cognito user pools. And then it's happy. And if we go back to our code, we can try again. My awesome post with an image, with an image, my content. And then if we drag, uh, upload my image, create a post, kind of read property ID of undefined. Okay. <laughs> um, I wonder where that happened. Uh, not read property ID of undefined. So I created the post successfully and create new post. Not sure what this is going to be. Um, create new post. So it's data dot create post. Uh, this should be as data create post mutation. We just typed it wrong. So it should be data dot create post ID. I think we Okay, no, it shouldn't. It should be create new post. Hello. Dot data. Dot create post. Dot ID. It was just lagging a little bit. Alrighty, so I think we actually may have created the thing, but it didn't navigate us because it didn't come back as the right type. So let's double check that. We created a post. This is the post here with the title of my awesome post with an image and the image has the ID there. And if we go take a look uh, at our S3 bucket, wherever that is. Okay, maybe we won't, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, the image should have actually uploaded as well. So I'll try again, blah, 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 blah. Upload another image. Great post. And now since we've typed it correctly, we have not navigated them to the right page. Not sure what happened. Post slash ID. Okay, what happened there? We'll go back to the home page. And the images have been created. So trying again. And awesome post with an image. Okay, so the router dot push didn't work. Not sure why. Let's try one more time. Try upload another image. Repost. Repost created successfully. Okay, I think that may have just been a small little bug with the hot live refresh. But as you can see, the post gets created. Obviously, the image doesn't work just yet. We'll need to we'll need to do something about that. Um, but now we can successfully create posts with form validation and we can also upload images to our S3 bucket. So I made a small mistake in the uploading of the file. We've got the file upload. And if you check out the files uploaded into the storage bucket, they don't have any kind of file extension. So the problem with that is if we go to the create and we see we're creating a file, but it doesn't have the extension that was uh, originally on the file. So it's just a file name without any kind of extension. And then when you download the file, it's not happy because uh, if we go to check out the 
and we'll go from, good lord, I have way too many tabs open. So if we go to the file storage bucket in S3, <clears throat> all of the files are being stored without any file extensions. So when you download them, they're not like PNG files or JPEG files, they're just files with no extension. And it's not playing very nicely with the UI and it's also not gonna work if we have different types of files being uploaded like GIFs or PNGs and images. So what I want to do is add the uh, file extensions. So the way I can do that is file, rather than just saying put file, we'll say plus file dot type maybe type uh, file dot type that hopefully is what we want and put that out so now if i go ahead and delete all this stuff uh yes permanently delete and if i try and create another post <clears throat> npm run dev to run the dev server. I'm hoping that this file.type is like the JPEG maybe. I'm not having high hopes for it. Uh, if I can get the docs. What if I console log file type before I do that? I'll say console.log file. <clears throat> So files undefined, should be JPEG for the type image slash JPEG. Okay. What if instead of plus file dot type, we say content type is equal to file dot type. Wonder if that will have the correct settings for us to upload a PNG file and then be able to download it. And upload a file, JPEG file, create post. We go to lost public, this, and download it. It downloaded at a JFIF file. Okay, that's weird, but, hmm. What if we upload a GIF? Um, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Image slash GIF. Okay, and then if we go to the storage bucket, wherever that is, brush this, and get uh, open. Can we download it maybe? Downloading as a GIF, okay. So now, if we go back to post preview, try replace this unsplash with post. We'll need to get it first. So we'll say, or the actual post image, if const post image, set post image, equal to use state uh, of string or undefined and it will be undefined by default and then we say use effect we will for the uh, download file so we we'll say const sign url so wait storage key storage.get we'll need to import storage from the aws amplify package We'll do that, get rid of the API. And we'll say import use state, use effect from React. This is planning that, await. So this needs to be an async function. Get image from storage. Put that into there and then call uh, that function, get image from storage, set post image, 
Find URL. We'll try. Catch. Error. Saw.log. No image found. So he should be post.image. And the URL should be of string or undefined. For some reason it's saying object, but I'm not sure why it would be an object. So we'll saw.log signed URL. And we'll say found the image. And from there we'll say pass the post image and we'll uncomment this existing code that we wrote to say if there is a post image uh, missing a bracket. So if there is a post image, then render this should be post image. If there is a post image, then render the image with the value of post image. And let's see what happens if we try that. Go back to our Reddit clone. Okay. Invalid prop. So after all that huge error message, it's actually just saying host name that is not configured under the next config. So we'll need to add that next config. And add that guy in there and refresh. Hopefully uh, we need to restart the server and then refresh it. Nice, there we go. Okay, so we got the GIF. And if we go back to the home page, I'll see if a post doesn't have an image, then <laughs> it won't it won't render the image. Um, it's still doing a bracket at the end for some reason. We've got an extra bracket there, but we're not really finding images here, so. We'll say if, if signed URL set post image. Uh, you know what we'll do? We'll just say down here, we'll say post image and post dot image. So that way it'll check if there's actually the field and then also check if it's loaded in as an image. And now the images the posts with no images don't try and get them. Uh, I think these are just bugged because we created them without the real image source. So we'll go ahead and delete them. Let's do that now. We'll refresh our posts. And the ones that aren't working is azed azed. So we'll delete that one. Delete him. And we'll delete. Uh, Oh, there's two called that. <laughs> um, I'll just delete majority of them, except for one that works, which is the top one. This is that as the name. So I'll just delete all of them except for that. Actions delete. And then we'll go ahead to the comment. Delete that one. Two. And we'll refresh our homepage. And as you can see, the image is loading in now. Looking good. Not sure why this is expecting an object or a string. It says nothing in the docs about being an object. So I'm just going to assume that it is an error and we'll say TS ignore here to just get rid of that error. That makes TypeScript nice and happy. One small little change that I will add is just to add the onclick handler to navigate us back to the home page when we click the Apple button in the header. Now, if we go back to home page, clear that, and we'll go back to the home page via the uh, button there. And then, if we go to any of these pages that aren't the home page, we can go back to the home page, and it looks much better. Another small problem that I noticed in the create code is that there is no logic if there is no file. So, we'll need to add an else statement to this if file, and we'll say uh, we won't include the storage path. We'll just say create a new post. Oops, copy that instead of pasting it. 
and we'll need to copy this as well to exclude the image path. So we won't include the image. Create new post without image. And say create new post without image input. And pass that in as the input here. And then route it or push them to the other thing. Uh, we'll copy that as well. Say route it or push. Create new posts with image dot data dot create post dot ID. So this way it will work. Uh, if the user uploads an image, it'll upload with an image. And if it doesn't, I'll just upload a simple text post. Now on the individual ID page, we want to add a section for users to add comments. So we'll say at the top of the page, uh, after the post preview, we'll add a space for users to add a comment. And to do that, we will use similar logic to what we've been doing before where we're using react hook form to create a very very simple form this time where we just have one simple form uh, what did i just copy copy that so we'll just have one simple field where the user can upload a comment and to do that we'll use some logic that we used before so we'll copy the type we'll copy the use form hook and we'll just copy all of the logic over from comment string. And so what do we want? We've got use form. We'll need to copy the hook from react use form and paste that in. What else do we need? We also need the on submit handler. So we'll grab that, paste that into our individual page on submit. Get rid of all this logic console.log the data in here. Data. And then we'll create a form with the settings that we have from before. Alrighty. And now we'll need to add a text field in here. So we'll copy the text field across as well. And we'll change that to be comment. And comment, 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 comment. Please enter a comment. Uh, min length is going to be not required since we have the required flag. And the max length is going to be, let's just say 240. Please enter a comment under 240 characters. And we'll need to import the text field. Uh, add text field to existing the comment here is not gonna be required doesn't look like we'll delete that unnecessary import as well so we've got on submit and we'll need a button for the submit as well so we'll add a button at the end of this button add comment and variant equals and color inherit and we'll say on click, uh, we'll just say type is equal to submit to uh, submit the on submit handler. That should console log the data, which in theory is just the simple comment. So if we go here, uh, it's not looking too good. We'll need some kind of padding. Just preview form. We'll add a margin up oh, 64. And margin bottom, 32. Okay. So I want this to be maybe a grid. So we import grid and we'll make a container. And we'll say these are both grid items. That flex box going as we've done before. And what we'll do is import grid. And what we need to do now is say this is spacing equals two line items or direction equal to row and just if we want to line items is equal to center. Looks pretty good. 
We don't want this much padding, it doesn't look like, on margin. Alrighty, and comment should be the style, we'll say full width comment. Okay, and it looks like we'll need some kind of flex grow potentially here. Um, because this width, I guess, is not, uh, not adding up. So we'll need to say stars, we're gonna do a width 100% here. Nope. Okay. Um, what do we need to do to get that across? I want this comment to, I'll add a multi-line flag to it as well. And I'll say style of the text field is 100% of the parent. And this grid has a style of flex row one. Nope, this grid item has a style of flex row one potentially. That's better. Okay, so just playing around with the different options there to get that across and we'll change this label to add a comment. I don't like this style, this, this button. So I'm gonna change that to, uh, we'll say default. Add a comment, a bit better. And we'll say, Bam, 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 bam. A comment, please enter a comment under 240. Shorten it. Comment and should be in the console here. Comment. Yep, looks good to me. So now in this function, we'll need to say, let's log data and we'll say add comment. Mutation. To do that, we will import the Mutation, so create comment, create comment from mutations, and we'll copy the existing code from what we just made, and we'll modify it a little bit to be a comment. So we'll say create new comment, give it to await API.graphql, create comment from mutations, and the input is equal to, um, Create comment input, and it's going to be ready. And you can inspect this. We need to import it first. Uh, we want to create comment from API. Why is it not? Okay, so we got ID, post ID, and content. Uh, we don't need ID. We just need post ID to be post ID. Um, this needs an equal. That's why it's complaining. Sorry. Post study and content is equal to data dot comment. And ID gets auto populated, so we don't need that. And new comment input goes down here. Create comment mutation. Try and auto populate that mutation. Import that. And from this, we'll need to Import the GraphQL auth mode again, just to solve that little TypeScript problem that we were having earlier. We'll also need API from AWS Amplify. And what else we got? So const create a comment. We'll need to show that on the UI somehow. So once we create the comment, we probably want to add it to uh, some kind of state. So we we'll need to extract the comments out of state as we get them in. So to do that, we will create a new state variable. So we say const comments that comments equal to use state import use state from react. And it's going to be a type comment. So we will import that and we'll say it's an uh, initialize it with post dot comments dot items as comment array. So we'll create this state variable with the initialized uh, initial 
very, uh, sorry, the initial value is the extracted comments out of the actual post that we're getting from get static props. And once that's populated, we will be able to append comments to it. So what we want to do is instead of mapping over post.comments, we'll just say comments.map and we'll question mark there just to make sure it's not null. Um, not sure if that's required. Actually, we'll just leave that in for now and we'll say comments and we want to actually sort these comments now. So we'll add a step here, say to do sort comments by, uh, by created date. And then once that's done, we'll say the created new comment needs to be added to set comments. So we'll say set comments is equal to spread the rest of the comments in and then add create new comment dot data dot create comment as as comment. Alrighty. And that way, every time we add a comment, it should show up on the UI. And um, we'll, we'll add some sorting logic just after we test it works. So we'll say, hey, I'm a comment on this post, add a comment. And as you can see, it shows up in the UI, which is looking good. And we'll just double check that that actually worked in the API. And we can also double check that by refreshing the page to make sure it assists. We'll add a comment table. Looks like it is working. We'll just double check in the table. We added a comment. Hey, I'm a comment on this post. And the post ID is F9, which is the one we're on. And it's created by me. And we're creating it at that time. So now we'll add some kind of logic to filter, uh, sort the posts, sort the comments, sorry, as the, they are created. So the new comments show up on the top. So to sort them, I'll go to the add another comment. I'm the second, I'm the newer comment. That guy sucks. And add that comment as well. So as you can see, it goes down the bottom. Um, he should be unique. That's a problem. We've encountered another problem here where the ID that we're mapping for the key, I don't know why that's post ID. It should be ID. I don't know how that happened. So I'll just quickly fix that. Um, uh, I'll just refresh the page because I think it's a bug. And hey, I'm a comment on this post. I'm the newer comment. That guy sucks. So I want this newer comment to be above that one. And we can do that by saying comments.sort. Uh, and we'll pass A, B. Sorry, this is a, just enter that down there. So it's a bit easy to read. And we'll say a.locale compare b dot map locale compare locale compare uh, a, oh, we're missing the um, a dot created at dot local compare b dot created at dot map on number missing a bracket so we sort them and then I'm not actually sure if this is going to be the right one we might need to reverse it so we'll refresh and then okay so we got it the wrong way around so we say b dot local compare a I'm the newer comment, and then we say, I'm the latest comment. And as you can see, they're in the uh, descending order, I believe. So latest comment comes first. And we can just do that by running locale compare and sorting them, which is a pretty nice way of doing it. So one of the last things that we want to implement is the upvoting and downvoting of different posts. And the way that we currently have it is if you see in this schema, we've got the upvotes as integer and downvotes as integer. And you might think uh, just add an onclick to increment the number. However, uh, we need a way to tell if the 
current user has already upvoted a post or already downvoted a post. And to do that, I believe that we're going to have to modify our schema a little bit because we don't currently support uh, knowing who the owner of a vote is. So to do that, I'm going to create a new type called vote and we're going to be at model annotating that as well. And we'll say the auth rules is just allow, will allow the owner to have all operations, create, just copy that, create, update, read, delete. I think it's actually going to be the exact same um, as this. So we'll just copy that. We'll allow the private and the public to read our votes and we'll allow other users to read them and we will allow ourselves to create, update and delete our own votes. And this is going to be a, we'll split this, our split left. So I can work on them both at once. So we've got, uh, this is gonna be a vote, uh, vote array, I believe. I think that's how you do that. No, we'll actually put it in like that. I will say vote array and we'll enforce this is all going to be votes in the array. And it's also mandatory that it will be a vote, uh, be an array of votes and it won't have any null pieces. I'm butchering that, just cut that up. So this is enforcing that the array will not be null. And this is enforcing that any elements in the array won't be null as well. So it's a non-null array of non-null elements. That's what that syntax means. And to connect that to the vote, we will say, well, first of all, let's populate the vote. So actually, don't really need this, do I? I'll just say auth rules. And then beneath that, we need to define the fields of a vote. And to do that, I'm going to say, I don't want, I don't know why it's doing that weird syntax. There we go. And I don't want the owner to be specified because that will automatically be provided. So in theory, I actually want owner, but that will be provided automatically by AWS Amplify. And I also want the vote. Uh, uh, vote it will also need a post id so we'll say vote is uh we'll just say boolean because uh we'll say true upvote and false it was downvote and then the owner is inherited or automatically defined so we don't need to specify that we'll say connection we'll actually just convert this to be votes instead of uh, two different things. So we'll say connection, key name, by vote, or by vote. And then we'll say fields, ID. And then down in this vote, we'll say we have a vote. Uh, sorry, we have a post similar to this. So I'm just actually just going to copy this. We have post ID and we have post. And we have a connection, which is going to be post ID. And that way we're going to be able to access the post via the vote and vice versa. That's pretty much identical to what we did with this one. Um, not sure why that's orange and that's green, but I think it's probably just a syntax error, a uh, syntax styling thing. It's erroring out. So we literally did the exact same thing. We just copied this and added a new connection by vote. So let's see if our schema compiles here. I feel like I'm missing something, but hopefully not. We'll see if it compiles. Obviously this is going to break the rest of our examples that we've created. So we'll say amplify API GQL compile. Boolean. Uh, I don't know why I added that. That's why it's not happy. Okay. And then type boolean, it's because it's not capital. Key by vote does not exist. 
for model vote. Uh, so we're missing a key here. I forgot to add that. So we'll copy that from the comment. Now let's see key by vote. And the field is post ID. And what we want to get is the vote. That's what I was missing. I knew I was missing something. Boolean values cannot be used as sort keys. Okay, so this just needs to be string with a capital S. String is mandatory. Comment, delete that comment. Great, so now we can go ahead and amplify push. And we'll say yes. And now it asked me if I want to update my code. I don't know why I didn't do that before. I'll we'll say yes again. And I do want to generate all the queries and mutations and subscriptions. Cool, so now that's done. And all of our uh, mutation subscriptions and queries should be updated. The contents, images, and now I can access the votes as well. So you can see we've got the owner of the vote as well and the type of vote. So now rather than just saying uh, votes is an int, uh, the upvotes and downvotes are both ints, now we'll have a full array of votes and we're able to count uh, how many documents uh, or how many, how many votes are actually associated to that post. And we'll be able to filter them down to see if the owner is equal to the currently signed in user to specify uh, whether that user that is currently signed in is allowed to vote again or not. So pretty much this is going to allow us to say if the currently signed in user has already voted on this post, then only allow them to change their votes. Don't allow them to make multiple upvotes on the same post or multiple downvotes. And that's the reason behind doing this change. So now let's go ahead and try and implement that comment logic. Now, what we'll need to do is go back to our database. Uh, if you run amplify console API and select GraphQL. We'll go to data sources and we'll go to, well, you can firstly see we've got a new votes table created for us, which is nice since we added the app model annotation to the vote type here. But what we're gonna need to fix is uh, all of our posts, uh, one post currently has this upvotes and downvotes value. So we'll delete those. And what we will do is, you know what, we will actually just delete this whole thing and we'll modify our create mutation of the post create post mutation. So on the create page, see how this is underlined now with upvotes and downvotes because they don't exist. So we need upvotes to be an empty array. Uh, sorry, it should be votes, not, not upvotes. Should be happy with that. Create post input. Um, okay, so create post input doesn't seem to be aware of votes. Um, I guess maybe we don't have to include votes in it if it's just an empty array. So we'll get rid of upvotes and downvotes from that mutation as well. And then if we run npm run dev, we'll go back to the site. And find it. Yeah. Quickly refresh. We'll go to the create page. And we'll create a new post with cool stuff. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And we'll add an image. We'll add this GIF here. GIF, however you want to say it. Created. Now we'll get navigated to the page. No, we won't because it bugged out. We'll, so this is not a number now because we don't have upvotes or downvotes. So we're now on the page and this not a number should be, let's take a look. So we've got votes, items, an empty array. So what we'll do is we'll go to the Post preview, um, which is, where is it? Post preview component, here it is. We will 
calculate the votes that it has by doing something like we'll say we'll say post dot vote dot items dot length uh sorry we'll filter it first so we'll filter vote based on vote dot uh vote dot vote <laughs> um is equal to downvote. I oh, will do upvote first. And then so we'll get the length of that and then subtract the same thing, except we'll get the length of downvote minus. So we'll need to close filter off. What, what's what's a complaining about here? Right and sign. Okay. Post dot votes the items a filter. I think this is not not getting what I really want. Get the brackets happening here. And it's still not happy. Minus post Ah, uh, we need the length here. Yeah. Yep. Cool, so we're getting however many votes contain the vote field of upvote and however many votes contain the downvote. And then what we'll need to do is on the up arrow icon, so icon button here, we'll need to say on click equals um, add vote with the, whoa, add vote with the parameter of downvote. So that should be upvote, sorry, for the upwards icon. And we'll copy this same logic to the downward icon down here. And we'll replace upvote with downvote. And then we need to create this function called uh, const addvote is equal to async. And we'll just make an arrow function here. And what we want to do here is create a vote for this post. And it accepts a vote. Uh, vote type as string. And if we create a vote for this post, so we'll need to use the mutations and we'll need to say create vote. So we'll import create vote for this function. Say so get the typical API stuff. So api.graphql, create new post. So we'll copy this code, change it up a little bit. Say so create new vote is equal to await API to GraphQL, create vote should hopefully come up, create vote, uh, create vote. Mm, yep. So we'll import that from the mutations file. And we also need the const create new vote input is equal to create vote input type. Um, create vote input. Yep. Equal to what do we need to pass in? We need a ID and we need to pass in the vote and the post ID. So we don't need the ID because that will get automatically generated. So we need vote and post ID. Vote and post ID. So we'll use that as the input and we'll need to import that. So I'm clicking to use a pools thing. Uh, sorry, we'll, we'll import GraphQL auth mode. Copy that, paste it in at the top. And the vote will be the vote type passed down. So that'll be upvote or downvote. And we'll need to import API as well. Post ID is going to be the post dot ID, which is the post passed down as props. And create new vote as creates vote mutation. And then console.log created, created vote. Create new vote. Let's copy that. It's not coming up for some reason. And let's see. Get rid of that comment. It's pretty self explanatory. So let's see. The thing is, we need to say if 
there is an already existing boat. Um, or an already existing boat. So the way that we can do that is we'll need to read in if the user is present in any of the owner fields. So the current signed in user need to check the in the vote schema. We add, oh, we don't actually have it. We have the owner field and an imaginary owner field that you can't see, but we need to check basically if the owner field is equal to the username of the currently signed in user. So this will be uh, where the username is that created the, the vote. And we'll say if it's the currently signed in user, then change the existing vote that they have rather than creating a new vote. All right, so what we'll need to do for that is if there's already an existing vote, I'm thinking what we'll need to do is put it in some kind of state initially. So we'll say const has voted, uh, has voted already equals that has voted already and equals use state boolean of false. I will just set it to nothing at the moment because we need to figure out exactly what we're going to do. But I'm thinking, I think we'll say existing vote and that existing vote rather than just having a flag and it can be a string or can be, we'll just say string undefined um, and it's undefined by default. And what I'll do is at the very beginning, I'll say is effect. And what we'll do is post dot votes dot items dot map mm, dot find actually. I think that's probably what we want. Dot find uh, v. And we'll check if any v has the owner of the current current authenticated user. I'm not sure that's a function. Uh, what we can do actually, rather than rather than calling that, is let's use uh, we structure it from the use user hook use user and we'll say if it's equal to user dot uh, username yeah username hopefully that returns a string get yeah, username returns a string okay and so if user and this will need to update every time there's a user We'll say post.votes.find. So this is going to return either the post that it finds, sorry, the vote that it finds where the owner is the voter. Otherwise it's going to return nothing. So we'll store that in a try find vote equals post.votes.find. And if try find vote set existing vote to upvote else set existing vote to, uh, we'll just leave it as undefined. And we'll say, so now we have whether the user has voted on this specific post and what, what kind of vote they made. You need to use that in this add vote function. So I say, uh, if the user hasn't already voted, okay, this is actually quite complex because we need to say if they're changing their vote, then we need to somehow modify that specific vote. So we need to call update vote 
rather than create vote. And so we'll say if existing vote is So if they have an existing vote and existing vote is not equals to the vote type, so they're making a different vote, swapping from up vote or down vote to the opposite, vice versa. So if they're changing their vote, update vote rather than create vote, else uh, we'll cut that and put it in there as well. So I think this might work. If they have an existing vote and they're changing their vote, and if they also have an existing vote, okay, this is not quite what I want. So I don't want an else. I want if not existing vote. And then that's what I want. So if they're changing their vote, they'll hit this block. If they are making the same vote, nothing will happen. And if they don't have an existing vote, then we'll say, create the vote as we would expect. So here's where we need to say, um, we'll copy this, it'll be pretty similar. So it'll be updated vote equals await input update vote. And we'll copy this, see what we need to pass in to the input, updated vote input. Uh, I'll just say update vote, not updated. And this will be need, need to be update vote please come up update vote input and the props for that is vote and post id that doesn't seem to make sense um <laughs> maybe i'm missing something here const yes is equal to update vote uh addition variables what do we need to pass in here? We need input and we need condition. Okay. And the input just contains the vote, which is very odd. Surprise. This doesn't require the vote ID update vote, update vote, update vote input input. Okay. Uh, I guess it doesn't, which is strange. Anyway, update vote mutation is what it comes back as. And uh, this is going to be update vote input. But I don't really see how it knows which vote it's going to be updating if you don't pass the ID in. So I'm just going to pass the ID in anyway. Uh, that's going to be. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, this is actually going to have to be a vote or undefined rather than a string. <laughs> so that existing vote to, oh God, this is maybe not. So we'll leave it a string and the existing vote, what I'll do is just create existing vote ID. So existing vote ID. This looks really bad at the moment, but that's all I can come up with at the moment undefined so it's a string or it can be undefined and set it off with undefined and set it to be down here we'll set i don't know why i just set upvote here it needs to be set existing vote try find vote dot vote and so set existing vote ID to I find vote dot ID. And then existing vote ID goes down here. I'm really confused how it's it's not assignable to type update vote input. So confused. Um how do you specify the ID? Maybe I'm missing something here. ID.
Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confused. How does it know which vote you're trying to update? Um, I don't know. Maybe you pass ID in here. This thing vote ID. I'll try that, but I have a feeling it's not going to work. Log update vote. Updated vote. Update vote. Alrighty, let's see how that goes. Created vote. That is not updating because it's not stateful, which is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> um. Ah, oh God. Alrighty, so we'll need to store these in states. Um, so we'll do that when the post loads in. So we'll say const upvotes set upvotes go to use state number. And we'll set it to this uh, upvote. We'll do the same thing for this. The so downvote, downvotes, set downvotes. Alrighty. So we're just setting those same logic in state. And we want this to be upvotes minus downvotes. And set down votes needs to happen when you create a vote. Um, so if you add a vote, then you'll, uh, if you update a vote, otherwise if you add one, you'll set the vote set uh shit <laughs> if <laughs> this is stuff if creates a new vote dot data dot create vote dot vote equal to equal down vote set down votes down votes plus one and then if it's a good upvote we'll set it to upvotes plus one Okay, that was a nightmare. And now, if the existing vote, if you're changing, you'll need to say, if your vote was an upvote, if vote type equal upvote, then you'll need to increase upvotes. plus one and down votes minus one. So I set down votes that and set up votes to that. I don't know why that's a comma. And then if it's a down vote, probably a better way to do this, but kind of hard coding it. Uh, set up votes to up votes minus one and down votes plus one. Alrighty. All right, let's try it. Did my vote even get counted is the real question. Okay, so it seems like it did. And if we check it out via the database here, we refresh the comments and we'll go to the votes tab, items, so it was made by me and got an upvote here as the vote. So in theory, if I go back to thing, click downvote, it changed to negative one, which is what I was expecting. And this should change to downvote. Nope. Okay. That does not work creates a new vote, which is very odd. 
Update vote. Oh, I'm so silly. Update vote. Uh, query update vote. Is used before declaration. Uh, update vote. Uh, canal naming is hard. Update this vote. Update this vote. Uh, console log update this vote. Naming stuff is hard. Update vote has already been declared. I am well aware. Okay. Oh, what's going on? Go back to our database here. Go ahead and delete these. And we'll refresh the page. Pretty much what we'll do is press upvote. That did not go to plan. All right. So that went negative one. And what, what did we do? So what have we done? We need to set existing vote to true when they make a vote as well. So we'll say set existing vote to vote type and the existing vote to vote type so that we can definitely tell they voted. Alrighty, so upvotes is one, downvotes is zero. If I click downvote, got error and promise. Value for field key ID S is not found. I don't know what that means. I think it's probably because we're doing this. Just don't understand this at all. Like how does it not have an ID field to upvote something? It's very odd. I'm just going to put it in because I kind of trust myself more than this at the moment. ID is equal to uh, vote.id. But we don't know uh, existing vote ID. Why does it not want that? Very strange. It's going to include it. Um, see what happens. Back to our database, see what the hell's going on. We got one vote by me. There's an upvote. We got upvotes one and downvote zero. Okay. Another error. The variables we put contains field name ID. It's not defined. Really confused. Really confused. Post ID. Did I mess up the schema? Post connection, post ID. Okay. ID. Very strange. Am I missing something? Amplify. I'm gonna add everything. Um, very, very confused right now. Amplify API. Ogen. Uh, cogen, I'll just type cogen, right? Downloading the schema. Generating the operations. That's absolutely fine. I do have an ID field, right? Or do I not? Oh my gosh, that's why we're so silly. We're missing an ID field. Wow, that was dumb. All right, <laughs> we need to add the ID field to the schema of vote. That was what we were missing there. Uh, that's why there's no ID. You guys are probably screaming at me. If you pick that up, uh, that's all right. Should be a quick, easy change. We'd actually just say yes to all that and then go back to our code because Kind of already know what, what to expect. So we'll have the ID is equal to existing vote ID. And uh, 
that's not what I want, sorry. Line it up here. Create new vote input, idea gets generated. Um, what I'm confused about is why when I make an upvote, it does update the vote. Yep. If vote type is upvote, set upvotes to upvotes plus one. Set downvotes, downvotes minus one. If vote type equals downvote, set upvotes to upvotes minus one, downvotes plus one. Set existing vote to vote type. Yep. However, if you're creating a new vote, you'll say create new vote. Create vote, vote, vote type, post ID. Now, if create new vote dot data dot create vote is equal to down vote, up the down votes. If create new vote dot data dot create vote is equal to up vote, set, ah, uh, set up votes. That's where we've gone wrong. All right, so fix that little bug. Alrighty, now that that's pushed up, Let's try run our code again. All right, so as you can see, what I was confused about was how were we going to upvote the post, uh, update the vote, sorry, when it doesn't know which vote it's updating. And it's because we were missing this ID field. And it's because we made a silly mistake in the schema where we were missing this ID value here. Alrighty, so let's run the server again. And I'll open up the by uh, console API in another tab as well. So we can see what's going on in our database. Not happy with me for something. Votes to items or filter. Um post of votes to items or filter. Okay, well if, if take a look at that in a second. We got posts, so items, uh, votes, sorry, not posts. We got one vote by me. I'll go ahead and delete that. And we'll refresh. See what it's complaining about. So it says carry property filter of undefined. Let's just see what's in the console properly again. So we got posts, ID. Got votes and it doesn't have any items because there are no items. So what we should do is say number so if there's no votes, we'll just add some question marks here. Actually, what we'll need to do is say Post of votes, but items, post of votes, but items, question mark, equal to post of votes, the items of filter, otherwise it's zero. So if there is no votes on the post, then there's obviously zero upvotes, and we can say the same thing for the downvotes, except change that to downvote. So that makes it a bit happier. Nope. Cannot read property find, find to find. Uh, what do we got here? Where's find? I don't know why I did all files there. We go find. Um, well, obviously it's gonna break if there's no items there. Try find vote. Add a little question mark there. Alrighty, so we've got zero upvotes, zero downvotes. And if we press the upvote button, we'll create a new vote. And if we go to the database, we've got a new vote by me. And the vote is upvote. And if we click upvote again, nothing happens. We need to maybe change the color or something. It's a bit more obvious that we've upvoted. Hopefully nothing happens. Yep. And then downvote, we get an error saying 
variable input has coerced null value for non null type ID, which means we've got this. Hmm. Existing vote and existing vote is not equal to vote type. Let's see, where are we missing? Vote. Vote. Set existing vote. Set existing vote. ID. Uh, ID. To vote. Uh, we'll set it to update this vote. Dot data. Dot update vote. Dot ID. And once again, set existing vote. We'll copy this, paste it here, and change that to create new vote. Create new vote. Dot data. Dot create vote. Dot ID. And we'll need to put that. Uh, we're assuming that it's succeeding here. It won't always succeed, so that's not 100% safe, but we'll just leave that for now. So, well, we got a problem right off the bat that we're not getting our upvotes from the database. So, it's not good. What's wrong there? The initial upvotes. So, upvotes and set upvotes. So, post upvotes are items. Okay. Post votes dot items. How can that be? Hmm. Okay. What I'll do is console dot log post. Fresh. I'll get rid of these other console.logs. Get rid of this guy, get rid of this guy. So we can see more clearly what's happening. So we've got this post not returning the items for whatever reason. Um, why is that the case? So I'll go to our get post query um, on the queries file and we'll go to get post. You can see it seems to be here. However, what about our API, get post, query, comment, votes, items. So it's all there, just not recognizing. Did I, uh, oh, I see why. Oh no, oh no, that's not good. Post preview. That's actually really confusing. It works on the, <laughs> the actual page. And if you upload and download, it works, but it doesn't work on the home page. So we need to figure that out. I'll list post. We so we've got items. Yeah, this is what I was suspect, suspecting. So we've got votes and you'll see there's no items like there was for our get post query. Uh, so there's no votes items. And the reason is if you remember our, uh, you know what, I'll just go to the command line. If you've been watching since the very start of the video, you know that we configured the depth of our schema to be three. And if we run amplify code gen configure, 
this may actually be more than three levels deep. So we've got list post, which is first level, items, second level, votes is the third level, and then items would be the fourth level underneath votes. So let's say TypeScript. Yep, yep. And we've currently got two, I guess. I thought we had three, but if we add, let's say four, and we run Amplify Code Gen again, you'll see that this query file gets changed. I'll try quickly stage these before it takes effect. But we've changed this max depth now to four. Not sure what it was before. Let's see if I can GraphQL config. So it was, uh, okay, we're not gonna go be able to see the difference, but queries and that has worked now, I believe. So we can see the votes. Yeah, we can see, wait a minute, am I tripping? Yeah, yeah, we can see, <laughs> here we go. Votes items has been added, as you can see by this green indicator here into our list posts. So now if I refresh the page, should still work on the individual page. It also should work on the homepage. Nice. And if I click downvote, very nice. Perfect. All right. So now we can upvote and downvote. And if you see in the database, we've got the my document being upvoted. And if I downvote it, it gets changed to a downvote. Perfect. Now we're going to go on to the deployment of this application. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to commit and push all of the code that we've created onto our GitHub repository. So we'll say git commit as m my cool Reddit project and say git push. We go to GitHub, go to my profile, all my repositories, and we've got a Reddit clan updated just now. And what we'll do is we'll go to vassell.com and we'll log in. You want to log in with GitHub. All you'll do is you create a new project and you'll see this Reddit clone project here. You just want to click import and you go to your personal account. Framework preset is just Next.js and just click deploy. So you'll notice that the build fails because you haven't actually pushed this AWS config file to your GitHub repository. Now, the reason for that is if you go to the git ignore file, the file, we scroll down a little bit, the AWS exports.js file is included in the git ignore, which means it's not going to be pushed to the GitHub repository because if you go to this file, there are potentially some sensitive values in here. And the way that you can fix that is probably, that's way you could do it is probably just create a .env.local file, which you would put the uh, Next.js environment variables into. And let's say we just extract this and say, uh, AWS project region equals maybe Southeast two. And you would say AWS, uh, you'd say process.end process region or whatever it was called uh project region i was close enough you'd say it is project region and you would repeat that for all of them but since i'm going to delete this project anyway i don't really care that much about it i will just go ahead and remove this file from git ignore so i'll say comment that out and you'll notice now we've got this project added to our git repo Go clear and we'll make another commit. Expose my stuff, get push. You probably don't want to do this unless, uh, you know, you're not going to have any users in your application because yeah, this is exposing all of your endpoints. So I obviously wouldn't recommend doing this in your personal projects, but you know, um, I'm just going to do it because I'm going to delete this project right after anyway. So I'm not that concerned about it. So now if we go back to the cell, refresh this page. And if we go to get, we'll just double check that it's actually updated. 
And the way that you can check that is go to your repository, credit clone, and you'll see we now have four commits. Expose my stuff. And we will try and build it again. Wait, so it's done. And just so I make that uh, that process clear, um, you would want to create a environment variables file, uh, extract all of your files, your your config values out, and then say process.env dot uh, whatever it was. Copy that region, and then when you deploy, there would have been an option to add environment variables and you would need to add these exact same environment variables from this file into the deployment configuration environment variables in order for that to work. And then you would do the same step that I did and you would exclude this from the git ignore and then git push it. Cool, all right, let's test our application on the production instance. So it looks pretty good. The user is not authenticated, so we'll go log in. Log into my account. Signed in, sweet. Actually don't think, oh no, we did implement the sign out button, sorry. Sign in again. I think I got my password wrong. Signed in, sweet. And if we click on it, all looks good. Can we make a comment? This is a cool comment. Add comment, looks good. Another comment. You probably want to clear this text box after it's submitted. That's probably something that would be nice to have. This is another comment, gets added to the top. And if I want to upvote it, downvote it, upvote it, it's good. If I want to create a post, another cool post. I like chicken, load an image. I uh, will upload this Patrick GIF. Created successfully. And as you can see, the fallback blocking was in place there. We couldn't access this post while it was being statically generated. And now that it has been statically generated, it can easily load really, really fast when you click on it. So the second user that loads this page will load this page really, really fast. As you can see, it's almost instant. When you click on the existing one that was generated at build time, it's almost instant as well. I can go ahead and download, downvote that one. And you suck as a comment. Sweet. It's all looking very, very nice. I'm very happy with it. If we look a little bit closer though, when we're making a comment, and let's say we add a comment onto this Patrick post, if we refresh the page, that comment is actually not showing up. And this is due to the fact that we're statically generating these pages and all of these, these data points of these comments they actually are going to the database, but since we're statically generating the pages, the data isn't being provided to them uh, since we provided the data at build time. The way that we do that is by using a thing called incremental static regeneration. And if you read the docs here, it says, Next.js allows you to create or update static pages after you've built your site. And it enables developers and content editors to use static generation without needing to rebuild the entire site. So you can imagine if our Reddit clone had like something like 10,000 of these posts. And if you remember, we only built this first post when we first deployed the site. And then the second post got um, statically generated when the first user requested it. And it got generated in the background. And while it was generating, we weren't able to access the page. But now this page is statically generated. And the problem that we need to solve now is the page is actually updating. The data points of these existing pages are updating. And we need to incrementally, incrementally regenerate them to reflect those changes in the database. And the way that we do that is by using the revalidate option. And this, as you can see, it says an optional amount in seconds, which a page regeneration can occur. And right now we've got false because we haven't provided it. So we are saying, if we want to regenerate the page, when a request comes in at most every 10 seconds, we will pass revalidate, sorry, we'll pass in revalidate 10. Let's go ahead and try and implement that now. 
we'll go to our code. We'll go down to the get static props method. Just double check that's where it goes. So we pass the revalidate. I'll just copy paste this whole comment section. Um, goes in here. Revalidate 10. What we'll do is go to our code. I will stage that file and we'll, we'll get commit. Update ISR and we'll say git push to automatically update our deployment. So since we used our GitHub repository linked up to Vercel, now since we've pushed to the main branch of our Git repository, it's going to trigger a new build. So you can see it's building our latest commit. So we can go ahead and check the logs of this build. So we've generated all of our static pages. And as you can see, we've got this ISR, which means there's no dot. And now we've got these two pages that are incremental. Cool. <laughs> I'll say that word incremental static regeneration pages. So if we revisit our, let's go to the homepage and we go to another cool post. You can see our comments are there since we rebuilt the site. But what we want to check is if we make a comment, a new comment, and we add it. I really should have added a little bit of code to clear this text box when you submit it, but that's okay. <laughs> also, please enter your username, which is obviously not right. So I commented on the second post. I said um, a new comment. And if we go back to it, it's not there because we set it to 10 seconds. But if we go back to it again and we refresh, okay, this is really not, not happening. A new comment. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Maybe we, we would want to lower it from 10 seconds. Uh, maybe, maybe set it to even something like one second. Um, I think I'll, I'll try it out with one second now. See how that goes and redeploy that. So change 10 seconds to one and we'll clear it. And we'll say git commit, change, I saw, you know, I will just uh, amend it and force push. That's just going to update our previous commit and it'll trigger a new, new deployment. So all we did there was change the, the, um, so we are capping it at most every, every 10 seconds. But, you know, clearly that wasn't fast enough for showing the comment or maybe it was, but just for this demonstration, I'll update it just to show what that value actually does as well. Okay, cool. So it looks like it's just about to be done. All right, so I revisit it. And that's not the right link, sorry. Revisit, visit the homepage. Let's create a new post. Hey, YouTube, add another image. Let's put in my head, create post. Hey, YouTube, alrighty. If we go back to the homepage, this is there. You probably want to implement some kind of um, sorting by date on this homepage as well. And if we add hello as a comment, see it's loaded in there. But if we test it out, go back to the homepage, go back to our post. Still not there. Still not there. Still not there. And there it is. Okay. Um, the thing is, I'm not that concerned about that because I think if another user came and saw the comment, then that would be there pretty much immediately. And realistically, a user isn't going to go add a comment, um, go back to the home page, and then, you know, immediately go back and check for the comment. I think they'll stay on the page and you know, they'll, they'll be able to see the comment. And if they just wait one second, they'll be able to see the comment as well. And the main benefit of doing this rather than regenerating the page every time is that it's super, super fast compared to if we were using get server-side props or fetching on the client side as well. So the other alternative, if you're really not happy with the 
uh, sort of not showing the new comments immediately when you refresh the page. I really just type the exact same spam. Okay, so if you're not happy with this not showing up immediately when you refresh, the alternative would be to fetch the comments of the post on the client side. So you could still have a really fast load time, but the comments section would be loaded in separately and you would show a loading state for the comment section of the page while you requested that from the database. So all of this would still be statically generated. You would just refresh, um, sorry, you would just fetch the comments from the database on the client side. And you do this if you really cared about showing the most up-to-date data uh, immediately and straight away. But the downside to this is that the comment section isn't going to show up um, immediately but it will show the latest data immediately once it has loaded. But in the meantime, you'll have to fetch the data from the database every time that you want to display this data. And it will show a loading state while you're fetching it from the database on the client side. And it's also probably gonna negatively impact the SEO if that's something you care about. But we've already demonstrated how to fetch data on the client side. So that's always an alternative if you would prefer to do that. If you guys enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button as it really does tremendously help out my channel. And if you wanna see more content like this in the future, consider subscribing to the channel as well. I'd love to have you join the journey with me. Other than that, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video and hopefully I helped you guys learn a couple of things along the way as well. If you're interested, I would love you guys to check out my other social media channels as well, which will be linked in the description below. But other than that, thank you so much for watching once again and have a great day.